Welcome to Kingdom of Context. I'm Sean. I'm your host. And today we've got a special a special treat. We're going to be having a discussion with some good brothers in, in the faith. And we're going to be talking about uh, who is the bride of Christ in Scripture. So between the four of us, we don't all agree on certain things about this topic. So that's what we're going to do today. Hopefully show the body that what we should be doing is getting together and discussing these things from the scriptures and, and hopefully, you know, f- figuring out where one or some of us may, uh, may veer off in some of our misunderstandings or some of, maybe we actually do agree. We're just using the wrong words. You know, I've, I've had that a lot in conversation. So that's what we're going to do today. And you guys get to watch it live? Um, we'll, we'll try to keep the discussion to um, a manageable time length so that we can take questions from the audience at the end. And overall, I hope it blesses you. That's our goal here. But I appreciate everybody that's already joining us for the live chat, which looks like we got quite a few people here. All right. Well, without further ado, guys, let's bring on our guests. And uh, that way we can um, get the get the good conversation rolling here. Okay. All right. So we have Tony Stover. Welcome, sir. What's up, y'all? Good to see you. Now, guys, if you don't already know, uh, you can find Tony Stover on Take on the World YouTube. And uh, that's where he has a lot of his content up. He also does a show with our other guest here today, Mr. Jake Grant. And they Hello. have it's a show called For What It's Worth, right, Jake? Yeah, For What It's Worth, it's, uh, it's a show. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. And that's on Jake Grant's channel. So, and then also we want to welcome Mr. Wes Blaze. Howdy, howdy. Now, what if up, he Wes? Has, Wes has his own music channel on YouTube. So you guys go check out Wes Blaze Music as well. And uh, he has a pretty large group on Facebook called Messenger of the Most High. So go check that out as well. So he has a lot of good information and a variety of ministries that he he uh, puts up on that channel for people to, to learn from. So it's a good place to get a lot of information. Guys, welcome. Welcome. We're going to talk about the bride today. Absolutely. I've been looking forward to it. It's. it's I just want to praise God real quick that we could get all of our uh, schedules lined up and together because... Uh, yeah. I made the joke before we came on that it's like we can only do it once in a blue moon, which today is, right? Is it really a blue moon today? Yeah. <laughs> is it really? <laughs> yeah, the, it's the second full moon of the month from what I heard. I may be wrong. That's what I saw. Man, I didn't even know that that colloquial phrase. That's cool. There you go. I guess that's what it means. All right, guys. I thought it was, uh, a, I thought it was the moon turning blue, which it never does. I thought that was just what it was talking about. Second full moon of the month. Okay. Now, when I was at that conference this past weekend, I had someone telling me they they had a a blue crystal and they were saying this is what the moon's made of. And I was like, Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so some yeah, some people may think it turns blue. I don't know. Um, so guys, we are uh, we're Should've having cheese. Yeah, or cheese, right? You know, it's hey, funny this is what it's made of. You know, the the potholes in, in the moon, right? A lot of people think, oh, it's asteroids, and um, even though it Anyway, we won't get too yeah. deep in that. But the point is, that's yeah. what the general theory is from the heliocentric globe, uh, the global theory of you know what's creating the craters in the moon. But if you go through biblical cosmology and you take seriously the way the firmament is described in Scripture, as well as the waters above it, um, there would be a ton of electromagnetic power surging through the firmament, as well as those waters, which you can produce the same effect on material, on substance uh, with those craters, if you're running large amounts of electricity through something. Like on a potato, I've seen it. Yeah, you can do that like on a small scale with a potato too. It looks just like the potholes on the moon. It's amazing. So it's, uh, yeah, anyway. Raise them in the firmament of his power. That's right, Psalm 151. That's that's what I always kind of referenced and thought that power meant was that it's surging with electromagnetic uh, power and electricity. Makes all things go. So guys, what we wanted to do, um, because there's a lot of people that are interested in this topic. So I think I think this particular topic, when I made the announcement on social media that we're going to do this kind of discussion, got more reactions than any other video I've probably ever put out. Because, you know, people may not always click on the like button or the react button, but they go ahead and watch the video. But this one, people actually were interacting with the actual announcement, on the social posts. So I think a lot of people are interested to see what we got to say and how we how we have differing opinions on this. So uh, what Wes Blaze and I decided, since he and I kind of agree more than than uh, I think Jake and Tony, you guys agree on your interpretation, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. You guys want to go first and y'all can just lay out how you guys see this idea in scripture from scripture? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Cool. Sounds good. Since, since you guys have videos, since you have videos out and we were able to look at 
what your entire thought process was and uh, your interpretation was, it might be fairer to you guys to hear our full interpretation. Then we yeah. kind of hash it out. Yeah. Cause I've heard a couple different variances of this theory. Yeah. Uh, Cause you know, right off the bat, most of the people may have seen from the thumbnail, but uh, West Blaze and I, we, we believe that the bride of Christ or the bride of Yeshua, the lamb is actually the new Jerusalem, the city, the land of covenant, the land of promise. Whereas I think Tony and Jake, they believe it's more the people of Israel that are in the covenant that then eventually marry Yeshua after the resurrection. It, uh, we're actually, a, I think we're closer than our, our, we're closer than what, what you think. We're, sure. we, we sort of are tying the city and the people together where you are not wrong in certain ways, but it's leaving out the people as far as, but we'll, we'll get into that. Sure. Go ahead. Let, let us, let's, how would you guys describe it? So, uh, Tony, do you want me to start or, or what, would you want to? Ladies first. Okay. Well, uh, there's no ladies here, so I'll go ahead and take the stick. <laughs> um, <laughs> Man, lead the uh, so, way. So basically the premise that Tony and I will be discussing is that uh, throughout the scriptures, uh, the people uh, have always been referred to on, almost in a synonymous fashion with uh, the city. Um, so uh, you have the people within the city committing the sins, and then the city uh, is being uh, spoken of in, in various prophets and, and various places in the scripture. And, and these are all uh, synonymous terms with the people that inhabit the city. Um, and so the people are the ones who pollute the land. The people are the ones that are kicked out of the land. And, uh, and so whenever we talk about marriage and divorce terms, uh, it's those that are revolted from the land um, that are being referred to as kind of the whore, the whoring bride um, in several uh, passages that we'll get to. Um, but it's the principle that the new Jerusalem and this coming bride is synonymous with the people that will also be inhabiting uh, the new Jerusalem. And it's not simply explicitly the brick and mortar uh, that Yeshua will be marrying, but rather uh, the people that are all, all also synonymous with uh, the new Jerusalem and those that inhabit it make up what the new Jerusalem actually is. Um, so, uh, uh, each, each one is, po each one is pointless alone. The people without a city, they have nowhere to be. And the city without the people has no one to be in it. So they, they're sort of pointless without each other. They rely on each other for, uh, a connectivity. So, uh, when we talk about, uh, who the Messiah is coming into marriage covenant language uh, in the scriptures with, um, I, I have to point out right here at the beginning that um, we have throughout scripture uh, similitudes and things uh, that there's a term uh, uh, called, um, uh, I'm, I'm spacing on, it's a, uh, a, uh, it is a similitude, basically it's a, uh, um, an example that our creator uses and that writers of the scripture use to uh, analogize different aspects of our relationship with him. And so uh, we have him refer God, depending on the wisdom he's trying to convey from verse to verse, uh, we are called daughters, we are called sons, we are uh, likened to Israel, we are called Jerusalem, we are called whores, uh, humans are called pillars, they're called stones, they're called uh, cubs, chicks, brothers, uh, virgins, wife, you know, all of this language is used to convey wisdom depending on the verse and the context of what he's trying to communicate, a, a spiritual meaning uh, behind these kind of uh, similitudes that he's using throughout the scripture. Uh, so is that to say that God is a, a chicken when he compares us to chicks? Not necessarily. He's making that as an example to show us uh, a deeper meaning, a spiritual understanding of, of what he's getting at. And so throughout the scripture, uh, the, the language of marriage is one of the most uh, beautiful and important similitudes uh, that are used to describe mankind's relationship with our creator um, because the process of headship and authority um, and how we align our hearts and submit to his word um, is is really a, a picture of what a well-functioning marriage looks like. And so in likelihood, um, 
if the Messiah is our perfect example um, to walk out on earth and that first John talks about how uh, if we say we know him, we are to walk also as he walked, um, then uh, we can then make the assumption that the marriage language can then apply to the church and how we are to treat treat our, our Messiah. Because if he's our example and we are to submit ourselves to uh, his example, his commands, um, uh, which were the father's commands, then that means, um, you know, we're, we're kind of playing out this, um, this similitude of a marriage language, uh, which is talked about in some of Paul's writings, which likens us to this bride that's being presented as spotless. Um, and, uh, we'll get into some of those verses. I'm just kind of going over some of these, uh, top concepts. We're not debating that there is uh, passages that say the new Jerusalem comes down as a, a bride adorned for her husband, but the premise we're presenting is that those who are in the new Jerusalem are also uh, referred to and considered uh, part of it. Um, so just a, just a quick example, and we can go through all of these again, um, so is rebel- wouldn't that well, Go ahead. Wouldn't would that also make Yeshua the bride then, since he's inside the city as king of the New Jerusalem? Well, if uh, Yeshua is our example and the analogy of the marriage covenant can apply, then um, then we are also you know we're able to apply the metaphor of marriage to our relationship with our our Messiah. Let, let, uh, let's take let's take the word marriage and whenever we're whenever we, how we see it in Scripture, right. it's right. describing the Headship and submission, the it's sacrifice a, and submit. It's a covenant Wherever, issue with Yeshua as the king of the covenant, right? Right. Right. So so it's a like everything we have here, it like physically, physical marriage is really just a pattern of a spiritual implement. Is it, it is, even the even the uh, consummation stuff? Yeah. So there's yeah. not a literal consummation of of like there's not an actual marriage happening between men and the Messiah that, that would, you know, that's a contradiction of Torah, which is a man marrying another man. That doesn't make sense. Uh, but it's a spiritual premise, which doesn't take away from the idea that, you know, there is a type of consummation of us dwelling within the new Jerusalem, right? Th- that, that kind of, you know, the coming in and becoming okay. one I see is an analogy okay. that applies, but the meta the metaphor still applies to our spiritual relationship. Um, but there's metaphors that uh, are used throughout the scripture that likens the people with the actual city. So uh, I'll, I'll bring out this first verse is Revelation 3, 12, um, which says, uh, talking to those who are ret- victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. So will he literally make them a pillar um, or is this likening them to a you know, and a, a, a metaphor that he's making there. So he says, uh, Revelation three twelve. the one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. So you're going to have a bunch of people with the actual name of the new Jerusalem written on their forehead. Does that mean they are the new Jerusalem? Or does that mean it's a, a similitude that's being used here that, um, you know, uh, that the people that are part of the new Jerusalem that have, uh, you know, become victorious, they are uh, likened to this bride analogy that we're, you know, trying to discuss here in scripture that the new Jerusalem is not simply the brick and mortar, but those that comprise the new Jerusalem, such as when he says, I will make them a pillar. Will they literally be be a pillar? I mean, I don't know, but if, if this analogy can be applied, then, you know, they're being likened to almost like brick and mortar. And, uh, and this seems to, you know, go into the whole premise of what the new Jerusalem actually is. It's comprised of also the people that, um, you know, are in it. What we're going to say, Sean, West blaze. Do you want to take this or do you want me to say something? Um, uh, this is such a big topic. I mean, it, it's going to touch on Christology. It's going to yeah. touch on the covenants. There's there's just so many aspects that I know that there's details of which many of us disagree on. Um, so it's I don't know where to start. <laughs> well, I, I my first thought would be just looking at the verse that's being referenced, Revelation 3.12. I do have it on the screen. 
for everyone to look at as we read along. And I've heard this before, Jake. I've heard this idea of people saying, well, we're not literally a pillar, but he's telling this is the metaphoric language of him making us a pillar in the temple of my God. Well, this is where I would challenge folks to say, well, it, it's not telling you you're going to literally be a pillar that doesn't stand and is just holding up a structure like a like an architectural point of support. But the word pillar is already a pseudonym that's used in the Old Testament for someone that's righteous, who does the righteous behavior of God, who is steadfast and faithful, who never deviates from that behavior. And he's counted on, uh, which hence the metaphor of the pillar comes in uh, for that synonym. So that's it's not literally it. It almost be like trying to take that metaphor and making it a hyperbole. It's it's almost like saying for everyone that uh, that talks about biblical cosmology and you you run into someone that says, oh, wait, are you a flat earther? And they're thinking in their mind, they're thinking of a land, a piece of land in space, like a pancake, mm -hmm. water falling off the edge with stars and space and void all around it. And yep. in my mind, I'm thinking of the firmament structure and, and space is not anywhere in this equation. You see what right. I mean? So to say that, to say that uh, uh, that the interpretation is that you're just marrying brick and mortar, that would be a hyperbolic metaphor that's not taking into account all the details of what's described as New Jerusalem. Similar to this passage here, because there's three points just in this passage right here that I would I would lovingly challenge. One being how the word pillar is being used out of its Old Testament context to make the metaphor seem ridiculous. So it's not we are not going to be made a standing structure to support something above it. We're literally going to be steadfast in righteousness. This is why we're priests who rule and reign with Yeshua for a thousand years. S secondly, I would say the, the concept of the word name of the city of my God that's put on him. Well, let's look at that in two different veins real quick. It says the word name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes out of heaven from my God and my new name. That means two different names are written on the, <laughs> on this person. And that sounds even more ludicrous than one name being written on this person, right? Because that's why we're taking the word name out of its Old Testament and New Testament context, because the word name isn't literally a writing. It's not literally writing Zion or the New Jerusalem on someone's it's head. A character. It is your authority. That's what the word means in the Hebrew and the Greek in the Old and New Testament. So this is why we are made priests of God during this moment after the resurrection and we're taken into Zion, the new Jerusalem, which is our land of inheritance. And we're, we're made priests in the Melchizedek order under the authority of Yeshua. That's how we're given his new name. His new name is not some special name that only he can pronounce. It means his new authority, the same authority that he said he receives that he's destined and prophesied to receive, which is all authority in heaven and earth. We share in that authority with him, which is what he promises in the previous chapter in Revelation 2, 25 through 28, where he says, he who overcomes, I will grant him the right to sit on my throne just as I overcame and sat on my father's throne. So this is this placement of authority in our priesthood that we step into as with the law written on our heart at the resurrection, which what makes us a steadfast, faithful pillar in his temple as a priest. So this is where that's my interpretation of that verse, which takes away the illogical nature of being a literal pillar or having literal names written on you. It's it's actually the term defined for us in the Old Testament. I, I don't well, think Jake was trying to say that we become a literal pillar. I think he was just showing this is one of many verses that tie uh, people to construction people to the metaphors. city. So uh, out of this, well, just, that's what I'm saying. You know, I agree with what you're saying, Sean, is that you know it's not an exact, you know, you will become a pillar, and so the premise being, you know, the many multitude of uh, metaphors that are used to associate people with the city of Zion or, or you know, these different metaphors that are used, how is this not still applicable to the bride of the Messiah um, in terms of, you know, are we taking, you know, Revelation chapter 21, 9 through 22 about, you know, the, the New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having glory, you know, and radiance like a, a jewel, you know, as a bride prepared for her husband, you know, are, are, I'm wondering how literal are you guys taking that to the point that it excludes the people that must dwell in it? And that, you know, it, is it, is it that because that one verse talks about the city itself being a bride that you're hyper focusing in on that and ignoring that multiple other locations identify people as as structures and as locations and and you know you know i'm just trying to understand here you know well, that's what i was trying to explain is this particular passage doesn't identify people as any type of structure 
It's just literally, it's a synonym for their behavior, their righteous character. They're given it their with their incorruptible body and, and Torah written on their heart at the resurrection. So it's that would be the the misconstrued metaphor is to say that it's it's equating them with an actual structure of any kind. It's not. It's paying inside this temple of God, you will be this type of character. And I, agree, I, would... I agree that it's metaphorical language, much mm -hmm. like we see the word used as when it says in Revelation 21, uh, prepared as a bride. However, it, it seems to me, it strikes me that when he goes on to say in verse, what is it, 10 or 11 of Revelation 21, when the angel says, I will show, behold, I will show you the bride and the wife of the lamb, that that doesn't seem as, as metaphoric language, neither does it in Isaiah 62. Which I, I, it doesn't have to be because if he shows him a city that's full of people, he is showing them the bride. So when when Wes Blaze and I get to our point, where we lay out a lot of our scriptures because I don't want to interrupt too much. I just want to try to make okay. a natural flow of conversation that the audience will get kind of stale if if um, we don't interject at all. And you guys just lay no, out no, yeah, 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and so like, I, I apologize. I don't want to misrupt your, your momentum, but I just want to make sure just trying to create some natural conversation here. But. I, so when, when West Blaze and I get to the point where we actually lay out some of what we're talking about, we're going to show you how in the Old Testament it's called the bride and it's without inhabitants at that time. Correct. So and we're going to we're going to get there. That's and, what I was going to make the point of with that. And as well as Second Ezra, it seems to me, from my understanding, that the structure and the land that it contains is called the bride without believers mm -hmm. already being in it. Yeah, we'll get there, though. And that's, but yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, I, Jake, I don't want to interrupt you too much. I just want to for the for the people watching. I just want to make sure they know that we're not we're not saying that Yeshua's bride is just um, is just a, the covenant is just a brick and mortar concept because it, it seems like a little bit of a hyperbolic metaphor to make it sound like that. There's much more to it. It's actually our inheritance, as Isaiah 54, 17 says. So it's a it's a it's a very important thing. It's not it's not something that we take lightly. And we do understand that it, it is our inheritance. The saints do go in it. So there is a connection there. But we're just trying to to, to define the specifics of that connection because when we start in our in west plays and i's opinion when you start conflating metaphors that's when people start right now we're we're just taking the the basic premise but where this premise is taken and where he west plays and i have seen people take this premise that's when it gets off into some really wonky doctrines that can't be supported anywhere in scripture so this is where you know i, I i'll let you guys keep going to to, to be fair relation 21 9 uh, where it says, come, let me, the wife of the lamb. Uh, if you keep reading down verse 12, it's in between nine and 12, the bride. And it's a, a wall great and high 12 gates. And at the 12 gates, angels and names written there on the names of the 12 of the children of Israel. So we have another tie in to, they are the authority of using the word name correctly. This, the authority of Israel is the city um okay well you do you remember how priests would be at the gate to render decisions and make judgments in the torah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that's why it mentions their name when it, in connection with the gates reference to the israelites who are yeah yeah but it's so still a, it's tied into the it's yeah yeah okay. for sure. so, i'm sorry jake go ahead you're 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 almost done i think or you're at midway though so uh, the, the premise of, you know, um, I mean, uh, chapter 21, verse 14, uh, and the walls of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Um, you know, there's an association um, with Jerusalem and Zion throughout Scripture with those who are the people. So um, so starting with uh, Jeremiah 3, um you know, three, two, it says, list up your eyes to the bare heights and see where you have been ra not ravished by the wayside. You have set awaiting lovers like an Arab in the wilderness. You have polluted the land with your vile whoredoms. And so um, whenever we see covenant style language, it's all always in reference to the people who've made a covenant with the most high, um, starting with a very marriage like covenant at Mount Sinai. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, the agreeance of, of the children of Israel to obey that covenant. Um, it's very, uh, it's very likened to a marriage relationship. Um, a ketubah is a, a very, uh, 
a, it's a you know a near eastern concept of you know contractual marriage where if i do this and you do this then we're married and so um it's very clear that throughout the scriptures that if it's the people that are covenanting covenanting with the most high then um, it's the people that are bring, being brought into covenant. And the covenant is why he uses the marriage analogy um, in multiple places. So uh, Ezekiel 36, 17 through 18 says, Son of man, when the house of Israel was living in their own land, they defiled it by their ways and their deeds. Their way was before me like the uncleanness of a woman and her purity. Therefore, I poured out my wrath on them for the blood which they had shed on the land because they had defiled it with their idols. The problem is never with just the land. It's never with just Jerusalem, the city. It's always with the people inhabiting it. And so whenever there's discussion of a breaking of a covenant, which is likened to that marriage ketubah, and, and uh, Tony has uh, you know a little bit that he wants to go into on, on explaining the, the Near Eastern marriage process and how it really does reflect what our Messiah is going to prepare a place for us and he'll come back. So he'll talk about that, but let me finish th in these uh, verses that, you know, the people are the ones that break the covenant. And, and so this is why the marriage analogy is so important throughout the scripture. So Isaiah 24, five says the earth is also polluted by its inhabitants for they have transgressed the laws and violated the statutes and broke the everlasting covenant. Um, so I'm just running through a bunch of verses here that explain how um, it's the people uh, that are making covenant and the people that are breaking covenant. And so for a bridal language and an analogy to be used um, in the New Testament concept with the book of Revelation, it's important that you know, if there is a, um, I just remembered the word is an, an anthropomorphic expression, which God uses, uh, you know, everyday concepts, uh, you know, a man, a husband, a wife, marriage, you know, fatherhood, um, servanthood to explain to a spiritual, uh, you know, spiritual wisdom, then if it's always the people that are making the covenant, then if marriage covenant language is being used in the New Testament, then it is applicable to our relationship with our creator. And, and, and so um, Jeremiah 16, 18 is another example here. I will first doubly repay their iniquity and their sin, Jeremiah 16, 18, because they have polluted my land. They have filled my inheritance with the carcasses of their detestable idols and with their abominations. So it's always the people breaking and entering into covenant with the most high. And of, and of course, um, there's always a remnant of people that seem throughout history to, you know, continue to keep his commandments to be preserved from the wicked way. And these, um, are what we can look at the book of revelation and some of the discussion of the, the churches that are mentioned in the first few chapters of revelation of, of those who have not, uh, soiled their garments. It's those that have not, uh, spoiled their walk that are still looked at as blameless, uh, which talks, which um, kind of ties into um, Ephesians and the premise of, of uh, husbands love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. So Christ being likened to a husband and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of the water through the word and to present herself, er, pre present her to himself, as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Uh, so it's always the people that are being addressed when we we're talking about this um, marriage analogy that's throughout scripture. And, um, and so the importance of this being that uh, it's those that are keeping the commandments that are referred to as those who have not soiled their garments um, in the beginning chapters of revelation and, and what, whoever the writer of Ephesians was, was that he, he wanted to, you know, have the church presented, um, as holy, uh, which is an analogy that ties to the, the virginity of a woman given in marriage. You know, you didn't want a spoiled bride. You didn't want a woman who had gone and played the whore. And that's why, uh, the analogy of, of, uh, Christ as kind of this husband figure is still applicable. And, and while it, it's not a literal, um, marriage where he consummates a marriage with all of mankind, 
it's a anthropomorphic expression that God is using to help us understand our relationship and the necessity of mankind to submit our lives to him as our headship, uh, our Messiah. You know, if in the millennial reign, the Messiah is ruling from New Jerusalem and he, you know, from Zion, righteousness is coming out, then people submitting to his commands is the same process as a wife submitting to her husband. And so that's why if we take the literal um, analogy of, you know, the New Jerusalem coming down as a bride and we say he's he's marrying the city and not the people, then it kind of null, it, it kind of goes against the the spiritual uh, application of treating the Messiah as our headship, as our husband um, and obeying his commandments and submission and that's and so and that's your that's your interpretation, right? Is what you would think that it would nullify that concept? Because I don't think West Blaze and I, I, I think we're on board with what you guys are saying. As far as anyone that's a disciple of Yeshua, he, you know, he's likened to in metaphoric fashion as a husband over us because he's our authority over us, right? So I don't yes. think we disagree with that. That's not that's not the issue. It's I think it's where you guys, uh, your view is taking that idea of Yeshua as our Lord being like as a husband over a wife and saying that if the city is literal and we actually enter into some sort of covenant with the city, then that nullifies Yeshua being our husband. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm not saying it nullifies it, but um, I'm kind of trying to understand where you guys are coming from, because if you fully agree that the metaphor of Christ being like a husband in the way that the church is to submit themselves to him, then we're not really debating on too much here because we can both see that, you know, the language of going into a city and, and, uh, and, you know, becoming one in the city, you know, is significant. But whenever we're in this millennial reign time frame and we're submitting ourselves to the mind of Christ and we're obeying him, you know, then is that not the same as an analogy of becoming one with a husband, you know, one in heart and action and deed? And so, like, if you guys totally agree that that metaphor well, that is, is still applicable, then what are we debating necessarily? Well, that who in, who actually enters into covenant after the resurrection? Who? Why is this language being spoken of of the city as a wife and a la- of the lamb? And, and that, you guys, you guys are suggesting that it's not literal; it has to be metaphorical because it must it must assume that the people are in, are included in that language. And we're trying to say there's Old Testament verses that will lay out for you that actually tells a, a clear distinction and differentiation between the city, the people, and Yeshua. And that there, and if it, I'll go ahead, most please. No worries. I was just wanting to ask. I guess uh, in layman's terms would be to to describe the details of God's response to that marriage covenant that you guys are, are proposing, what, how they broke that covenant. What was God's response and how did he handle it? How was he able to reconcile it? I guess just in, in bullet point terms, if you could. So uh, my current perspective is that anytime Yahuwah throughout the scriptures interacted with mankind, it has always been the mediator, uh, our Messiah. Yeshua, Yahushua, and this is indicative um, uh, with, you know, per- particularly I'm fascinated right now with the the Jonathan uh, Targums and how any instance where Yah makes a covenant with mankind, uh, he's pretty explicit that he makes a covenant with his word and whoever he's talking to. So an example of that would be... Uh, um, so in the story of Noah is one is as the Lord instructed him, the word of the Lord covered over the door of the ark upon the face thereof. And the word of the Lord was merciful upon him. And uh, another portion is, and the are Lord. Reading, in his, I'm, I'm sorry, Jake, to interrupt you. Are you reading out of the, the Targum? So this is the, uh, the, a concept that I'm, I'm pointing out that's found in the Jonathan Targum. Mm-hmm. And it's where any instance where Yah makes or mm-hmm. mediates a covenant with mankind, uh, he seems to very explicitly say that he's mediating through his word. Yeah, and I heard you. Is, I, I was just making sure the the viewers were understanding yeah. what you're reading from because I had scripture on screen earlier, and there is a there is a scholastic and and yeah. literal definition between the, the targum that you're reading from and what yeah. we are commonly referred to as the the Bible. 
Right. Yeah. So uh, the Targum is uh, basically a an Aramaic rendition of kind of oral tellings of the Torah, and mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it was uh, created about the ninth century. Uh, well, there's right. older, you know, th right. there's some, some, you know, uh, scholarship that says that it's, it's a much older document than the ninth century for sure. Um, there that's are the, some, the, okay, go ahead. I was gonna say that's the Ancalos Targum is the one that they date back to the second century AD, but the Jonathan Targum is the one that's been revised with lots of, uh, insertions by rabbis uh, up until the ninth century AD. So that's, I just want people to be fully aware of what you're reading from. And we, we can so, be pretty much sure that the rabbis are not going to interject the Messiah into any of this. No, I get it. But you guys are interjecting the Messiah into this. That's the, that's that, the idea. You, he, your interpretation is that you're saying you're interjecting right. that it must be the Messiah showing up. Something it, I noticed yeah. saying, Jake, was that any time that the father interacted with mankind, it was through the Messiah. Whereas I'm seeing a whole host of angels named in the book of Enoch, which you, you dramatize very well. And um, I, Yeah, I, I like that, by the way. That was really yeah. good. I'm curious uh, where, where they fit. Do, do they do they bring Yeshua with him with them when they come to interact with mankind? So there's many instances of mediation uh, in the scripture. You know, you have the angels acting as messengers, uh, but you also have uh, any instance where Yahuwah interacts with mankind. Uh, it, I believe that you know people of the Old Testament ha were saved in the same way people of the New Testament are, and that's because. Um, uh, they, Yah has to mediate with mankind through the Messiah. And so in that way, you know, whenever you see examples of mediation, um, you know, I, I believe those are instances of the Messiah um, interacting. Um, so and that's the, the reason I brought up the Targum, you know, of course, is because it really does bring out this concept of how it's the word. And. Uh oh, uh oh, he cut out. Jake, if you can hear us, brother, you're you're frozen. Maybe uh, refresh your your internet connection or something, or your browser, or just log back out of the log out of the studio and then come back in. Maybe yeah, it'll help. A out. couple seconds before we came on, he came yeah. right back pretty quick. But anyways, yeah, um, I mean, are you agreeing with everything you're saying, Tony? You yeah, hear? yeah. You you sure himself? So I'll lose you guys. Sorry. Hey, yeah. hey, Jake, we lost Video you for about 15, 20 seconds, bro. So we didn't hear anything you're saying. I apologize. Hmm? Yeah, he's. All right. We'll no, wait. come back. <laughs> How so are we, uh, what do you, you think? Yeshua says himself that the everything in the Old Testament was written about him. He said it. He said the, all the Torah was about him. What, what verse yeah. are you going off of? Uh, uh, John 5, 39, Luke 24, 25, 24, 25 through 27. I have John 5. Uh, no, I switched that tab. Uh, John 5. Okay, let's, I'll pull it up on the screen yeah. for everyone to see right now. Okay. So here's John 5, 39, and it says, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is these that testify about me. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Luke 24, 25 through 27. Okay. So you, you think that's him saying all the scriptures are him. Is that what you're saying? It's it's all about him. Like, uh, I don't know. Do you ever watch any of D Dutch Uncle John's stuff? No. Oh, you'll love, you'll love that guy. He looks like he'd just be some, somebody's uncle. He does a two hour presentation on just the first word of the Bible. And showing that it's all about the sun. Yeah, I've I've seen a, a great Hebrew breakdown on that. It's pretty cool. Yeah, Even, as and well so as the numerology the, and everything. But yeah, we have the first. Yeah, he gets into that too. We have the first word itself. Yeah, already saying this is what the scripture is about. It's yeah. all about the sun. It has to go through the mediator, the word. Yeah, but the word Bereshit used in Genesis one one. You don't think Yeshua was breaking down the alphanumeric part of the Hebrew, the Paleo Hebrew, to these Aramaic speaking Hebrews? No, I, I right. think that all of the Torah is about him. Okay. I just making sure I understand exactly the claim you're making. Yeah, no, no. I think all of the Torah is about the Messiah. Hence, he all of the feasts that were given in the Torah are all foreshadowing okay. everything he, he is coming to live out. 
But this version we have on screen here, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you as a general premise. I just want to make sure we're not making blanket statements that okay. assume a lot of things that aren't actually said in the scriptures. For example, verse 27 that you that we pulled up on screen here mm -hmm. in the beginning with Moses and all the prophets. So that would extend past the traditional yep. terminology of the Torah from Genesis right. to Deuteronomy. That means all the prophets. So yep. in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel um, chapter eight, now let's we can even we could even take um, Jeremiah if we wanted to Jeremiah. Um, in any place in Jeremiah, or how about you're saying every single word of all the prophets was about Jesus? It, it's about the word. The word of the Most High is Yeshua. He is this. He is the word, the authority of the Most High. No man has seen the Father. No man has talked to the Father. You have to go through Yeshua, Yahusha, whatever, whichever. Well, wh which verse says that though? Which, which verse says no man has seen the Father? That you know that you have to go through Yeshua to talk to the Father. Because the Father uh, tells us in Psalm 102 and Hebrews 1 that he has his ministering angels he uses to, to interact with mankind. Yeah, but Yeshua said no man comes to the Father but by me. Well, that's that's through his priesthood, through salvation that's accomplished by Yeshua. But we're talking about messages given from Yahuwah down to mankind and how that literally happens. And you're saying it all was Yeshua back in the day. It's through his authority. It goes through the authority of Yeshua. Well, I just want to make sure that the, the viewers are following because that, I'm not even following. So I apologize. So, so you're okay. So you're, what you're trying to communicate is that you believe every time that someone showed up in the old Testament, one of the prophets received a word from the Lord in the old Testament. Are you saying that it was literally the pre-incarnate Yeshua that showed up and said those words, or was it just an angel that showed up through the authority granted to that angel from Yeshua, who was still in heaven before he was born through the womb of Mary? It's the same thing. It's not the same thing. It is because I'm saying it's it's in his authority. Yeah, but oh. <laughs> and authority is name. No, I, I understand that. I'm I'm saying like physically, literally, like when you know the three angels in Genesis 18 that show up with Abraham and have a meal. Two of them then go off to Sodom and Gomorrah to do judgment. Okay, one Was, of those could have been Yeshua. But does the text it tell us have, that? Does the text not tell us that? Yes, it does. But then people would have seen the Father. It says no man no. has seen the Father. The text tells us that it's angels. So it was an angel that was walking with Adam and Eve in the garden. Yes, actually, Gen Jubilees chapter three literally tells you that they taught they taught Adam and Eve how to tend to the animals, to do husbandry over the garden, and put aside residue. No, I'm talking about in Genesis where it talks about God walking with them in the garden. Well, there's a lot of things Genesis doesn't explain that the rest of the prophets do. So you don't see that as Yeshua in the garden. It does. It says there's angels that were helping them in the garden. Do you guys do you guys give any weight or validity to the Book of Jubilees and Enoch? I know you do Enoch, but what about the Book of Jubilees? Uh, really, uh, I, more of my study has been on Enoch. Um, I've not put a lot of time studying out Jubilees itself, um, but you know, it'll change. It's a game changer, guys. <laughs> It's, there's a reason why the first century rabbis told people not to read Enoch and Jubilees. They threatened them with not getting eternal life. And furthermore, we found, you know, they found Enoch <clears throat> in the Dead Sea Scrolls at the caves of Qumran. And Jubilees was what the sixth most common found book yeah. among those. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so, it's, it's got a lot of good information in there that really clears up a lot of these plot holes. Very much so. So uh, I guess, uh, you know, maybe to address, I, I guess we're kind of talking Christology now, um, yeah. but it's the, the premise in the Septuagint, uh, you can find that whenever Moses was stuck in the cleft of the rock, right? It says, Yahuwah walked in front of him and, uh, and Yahuwah declared Yahuwah is God. Mm -hmm. And so um, if, if the father is spirit and he's outside of, creation as we know it who says that who says that if if he created everything right yeah but and why is he outside of it well it, he he's he doesn't have to be outside of it that's right he, anytime he interacts with mankind it's always through the mediator yahushua um because that's that's knowable god so um well that's all that we're asking is for you guys to show us where we're, you're getting that from actual scripture and then i would ask who is like michael gabriel Fanwell, those guys, they're angels, right? Messengers. Yeah, and they they mediate. 
Like they, they talk right. to human beings in scripture, right? Right. I mean, Enoch 15, God is uh, the Lord of spirits. And I'm guessing we both agree that that's the almighty. That's Yahweh, right? The Lord of spirits and Enoch. Yeah. So in Enoch 15, the Lord of spirits is literally telling Enoch, he's like, what are you doing? You're, you're not supposed to be mediating for these angels. You're, they're supposed to be mediating for you because that's what he created them for. They're to be ministers sent out to, to those who are inherent salvation. They're, they are a part of a priesthood in heaven that's mediate. This is why Yeshua was given more authority than even that priesthood in heaven when he was given all authority in heaven and earth. That's what Hebrews 1 explains to us. So this is, you know, this is where those angels, that was like their whole purpose on day one when they were created. Like they're sent out to to help mankind and communicate messages from the Father to mankind and to help them and stuff. So something interesting to me is was was all authority in heaven and earth given to Yeshua um, upon when he was being begotten, or was he um, given it after his resurrection? Uh, it would. I mean, I see him as the creator. So, because everything was made through him, so I, so he would have to have that authority of the Father to create this place. So, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word and the Word was you know was with God and was was God. So. That's what I was trying to bring out with the Targums, you know, no matter how much weight you put on it, anytime you have covenant language and, and I understand the role of angels as messengers, but yeah. anytime you have covenant language, um, I, I think that the Targum might be showing something here that it's always been the word, mm -hmm. you know, but that Yah, the father is making covenant with mankind is through his word. And if okay. the word is our Messiah, Yahushua, according to John one, then that's the mediation we're talking about throughout the Old Testament is it's not to take away from the role of angels as, uh, you know, messengers or people that go and, and, and give dreams and visions. Yeah. But anytime covenant language is talked about, it's always through the word. OK, um, well, here's here's why we were trying to address that, because okay. we we heard what you were saying. And that's why I was trying to address the idea. Um, for, I would like to, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to address both John 1, 1 and Genesis 15, because Genesis 15 is a huge covenant moment where it literally tells us angels facilitated that moment and not a pre-incarnate Yeshua. So this is but in John 1, 1, even in the statement that you said, you, you know, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. Are we in agreement that that's what John 1, 1 says? Mm hmm. Okay, because some people use various translations, so I just want to make sure we're talking about the same translation. So, what does the word "God" mean in that verse to you guys? What is uh, to you? And then, then I'll ask you, what do you think the word "God" means in the Greek? Uh, it would be like the yeah, Elohim, Theos. Okay, so Elohim in the Hebrew, Theos in the Greek. Mm -hmm. So it says, "In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was Elohim," and then. The, the word was with Elohim. Elohim, yeah. So how was that? So you were saying that it he he that Yeshua was the creator, and that he which does this exclude the idea of the Almighty being somewhere in this equation? He's the he's the he's the source. He's like the number one. Like he 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 created through the Messiah. The Messiah couldn't do anything okay. without his Father. He said so. Okay. And okay. so I just want to make sure that because he was acting in his father's power. Yeah. Thanks for your patience, guys. The reason I'm asking some of these questions is because you, uh, we all have studied this stuff, right? This is what we do. People in the audience haven't. So I'm just making sure they can follow us. All right. Yeah. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to take this in baby steps for, for everyone watching. There's a wide variety of, of scriptural knowledge in the audience. So, um, all right. So if the word was in the beginning, the word was Elohim, and then the word was with God was with Elohim. What kind of Elohim are we talking about in those two uses of the word Elohim in John 1, 1? Is it the same as the Elohim in Genesis? Well, no, I'm just asking what, how are you guys reading this? How is your, how's your thought on this? Cause that's how I, that's how I read it. I okay. Well, I don't know how, okay. Well, I apologize. So I don't also don't know how you're taking it in Genesis. So um, if you would humor me and maybe just expound them on what you think John 1, 1, how it's using those two uses of the word God in the same sentence. That would help us out. So uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And he was God in the beginning through him. All things were made without him. Nothing was made that has okay. been made. So who's doing the creating Okay, the word. 
it's through so, the word that there's creation happening the you know and so the premise is that if he is the creator and this word is what's being referred to in and John 1 and is then inferred that he's the the son of god the messiah mm -hmm. Yeshua then he's been the one interacting with mankind the entire time and so well that's that's where the, we we keep jumping we keep okay. jumping in our language. I'm, I'm trying to slow us down to, so people can follow. Cause, and, and West Blaze, stop me if you think I'm missing something, but you know, we, we keep saying that it was the word that was here the whole time that keeps interacting, but we we've tried to, and you guys just acknowledge that there are angels that interact to get people messages from the father. I, yeah, I, I see where the, I see where the thing is everywhere that it says that God Elohim was interacting directly with people. That would be Yeshua. But that's it's where very I very clear that the angels were did it. I mean, we we all agree that that's say that again. That so, yeah, there, that there again. was also angels that did it. There was also angels interacting. We're saying anywhere in scripture that it says that the Elohim was interacting. So a good example interacting. A go. good example is maybe you guys can share your opinion with the exchange of Joshua and the angel of the Lord. And how there's a different kind of uh, interaction there between the angel of the Lord, which, you know, is, you know, commonly looked at as a Christophany, as, as an example of the word manifesting, um, because that angel or the angel of the Lord then allowed himself to be worshipped. And this is a dichotomy between the other angels that are found in prophetic scriptures that refused mm -hmm. worship. And so the principle being is that, you know, there's examples of Yah interacting with mankind where the, whatever entity is interacting with mankind allowed worship. And then there's in, examples of angels that refuse worship. And there's, so there's, is, there's just one, right? In Revelation 19, where John's having that vision in heaven and he tries to, he tries to bow down in obeisance to the angel talking to him. The angel's like, don't worship me. God's right over there. Worship him. There's, yeah. there's several examples in Enoch. It seems like, um, how the angels don't accept any reverence and they're, you know, so, you well, know, the Joshua five passage where the angel that says, I'm the captain of the hosts of the armies of the Lord, he shows up and they, and Joshua takes his shoes off and he bows down to him on the ground. There's two different words in, for worship in the, in the scriptures. And one of them is the word for obeisance, which is what's translated in the Septuagint. And that means you're bowing down in reverence to an authority in front of you. And yes, all angels would be an authority over us because that's the hierarchy the father set up from the beginning. The other definition of worship is literally what Yahweh is, is speaking through Moses to Pharaoh and saying, let my people go so they may go worship me on the mountain. And that's a literal process of sacrifice that's brought forward to the father through his priests in a specific order, specific ingredients at a specific time because they were going to celebrate Shavuot. This is, this is a the, the definition of worship. That's the, um, if I could use this word, the ceremonial version of worship is defined for us in Leviticus as a process bringing forth sacrifices, Leviticus 1 through 7. The other use of worship we see often is, is when people bow down, like David bowed down to Canaanite kings. We, they bow down. It's the same word for worship. It's just doing obeisance. It doesn't mean that you're honoring them as the Lord of Lords and King uh, of heaven. Like you're, you're not, they're not the Almighty. It's just simply, or even that it's a pre-incarnate Yeshua. It's just literally that Joshua's acknowledging this guy who says he's the captain of the host of the armies of the Lord. Who's that? Enoch and Enoch, I believe, and Daniel tells us, right? It's Michael. So it's it doesn't have to be a pre-incarnate Yeshua. Mm. Okay, so you know, there's a couple examples of uh of basically Yah speaking through various forms of mediation throughout the old testament the burning bush with moses are you guys saying that that burning bush is an angel it says it is it says it's an angel it literally says it in the text nexus three and so the a, pillar, so it's a messenger okay right it just says the bush was likened to be on fire look the bush yet it wasn't being consumed it's because the messenger of fire as psalms speaks of the angels was standing in the, in the midst of the bush but it, it wasn't literally a, a bush talking. It was an angel yeah. standing there. Yeah. Speaking in the first person of themselves as, as God. Yeah. Because that's what they're supposed to do as messengers. They carry his, his, his message. That's where they're entrusted with his, his words. 
Of course they do. We, we see angels in the visions of Isaiah and Ezekiel speaking in first person as if as if they're the almighty. That's what they're sent to do. Yeah. Would you guys agree that the, you know, the covenant process that happened at Mount Sinai was likened to marriage and it was sim like similar to a marriage covenant with the, the sprinkling of the blood and the ketubah and do you guys what, see what that parallel? What ketubah was there? So the Torah, the the commandments yeah. were the ketubah, which is a contract, right? Are you guys under the impression that 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 um, Exodus nineteen moment where the Father is speaking from the top of the mountain and the people are becoming afraid? Are you guys under the impression that that is the first time that those people ever heard the Torah? Uh, no. I believe the patriarchs. I mean, you read Enoch and a little bit of Jasher. It seems that you know the commandments were revealed to multiple patriarchs throughout history. So. Okay, so uh, I guess I'm asking about the Ketubah concept that you guys are inferring from that moment. What, what if you think it's a marriage ceremony and you think that the children of Israel brought out of Egypt were being taken into some sort of, and, and I'm using this word marriage loosely because we've already defined it. We all are mature about this. We know it's a covenant. So we think that they're entering into covenant with Yahweh in this moment and that they weren't in, in covenant with him before that. Is that the assumption here? So it's all, it's all based on the Deuteronomy 28 blessings and curses it's if you will obey these i will bless you if you will disobey i will curse you it's an if 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 then kind of point which is what a contract is and if they obey they become one with the most high they they're keeping they have a mind of christ like is the new testament principle is that's the whole premise of becoming one um you know having the heart of david loving his commandments is is you know how we align our lives and submit to the authority um you know of our creator so the way that you're explaining it then would make it seem to me that that was available since adam and that the the moment you're saying was a marriage ceremony on mount sinai how is that special <laughs> if it had always been available as long as they obeyed it's still an ongoing marriage like the whole thing the whole timeline is the marriage ceremony. It's still an analogy that can be applied no matter when, even if you were before Moses, you know, we knew there were righteous people that, you know, sought after God, Abraham. He, he was, it was counted to him as righteousness because he obeyed the voice of God. And so um, in the same way, the marriage analogy easily applies throughout history to how we are to treat our creator and his commands. And so whenever you look at what was happening at Sinai, uh, there's a, a lot of aspects of the, the feast where the 70 elders were brought up. There's a lot of different aspects of this whole thing that seem to be able to be um, looked at in, in the lens of a, a, a betrothal and marriage process. Do you know what that feast was, though? That feast was already predetermined, ordained. It was, it was Shavuot. Weeks. Well, yeah, which, which is, which is what, what's, what's the contention there? Because... Yeah it's all lined up with keeping his commandments. So no, I'm just saying like that. It wasn't a special feast for a ketubah metaphor. It was something, it was literally the reason he brought them out of Egypt so they could worship him on the mountain, specifically in the third month, the middle of the third month. Well, the whole premise of the second Pentecost is that, you know, he says, uh, you know, I'll, I'll ascend to my father so that I can send to you the Holy spirit. And that's when, you know, they were all gathered in the upper room. And you had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit happening with the apostles, which is synonymous with the whole becoming one. Like he he entered them, the Holy Spirit, you know, entered the apostles and they began to speak in tongues. Do you know why that happened though? Peter tells us why is that, why is that happened in the actual chapter, uh, Acts 2, verses 32 and 33. It's It was poured out upon them from Yeshua, who was now their high priest. Yeah, but but yeah. you know the, the whole indwelling of the Holy Spirit principle, and how we're you know we're likened to being the temples of the Holy Spirit. Um, the premise of Him dwelling in us is marriage covenant language of you know the the consummation of you know if we are likened to the temples of the Holy Spirit, then Him coming and dwelling into us is you know there's a marriage analogy there. Um, I guess I'm trying to figure out how we got to Acts 2. I thought we were at Sinai trying to figure out. You guys are suggesting that it was a metaphor for ketubah, which is a Hebrew word for a wedding, um, with including with the official contract involved. And this is where I'm guessing you would assume that the, the instructions written on the tablets would be like the official contract. Uh, the blood sprinkling would be like the consummation of the marriage on the wedding night. 
Is that so, where is that where this metaphor I, takes that? So no, I don't. It's, it's the same yeah. thing um, later on when Joshua sets and he does the sa a similar thing and has the people stand on Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. You know, he says, "I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day." Well, witness language is also part of a marriage ceremony, it, like having okay. witnesses. A ketuba requires a two witnesses. Requires two witnesses. So, you know, yeah, but they're the active participants in the ceremony. They can't witness themselves. No, it heaven and requires earth. requires a thirty, a third. Heaven party. and earth. Heaven and right. earth were called the witnesses, not the people. They were the yeah, ones that, participating in the agreement. But they're not getting instructions like they did on Sinai. They're not. They're not. There's, well, it's not that a host they, of angels that showed up. That was a separate, totally separate concept. Well, it does say, say that they declared the commandment, you know, the curses on one mount, the blessings on the other. So, you know, they were making a covenant with the most high with Joshua at that moment. So whether it's the dedication of people turning their hearts to keep the commandments, either way, the marriage analogy always can, can still apply. Um, so, you know, maybe we, maybe let's refocus in here um, because uh, we're kind of going to some different, areas I, they're probably my fault I, but i don't i don't believe that the, the the ketubah the whole marriage concept is from the beginning from the beginning all the way to the end it's everything like what is the point of hosea without marriage like i don't see our physical marriage as anything like between man and woman here as anything other than a and the whole concept of family fathers and children or parents and children that is all a representation of spiritual relationship between the husband and the sure. and the yeah, and the and the wife. Yeah, I don't but, think West Plays and I disagree. Do West Plays, do you disagree with that idea? That that it's a spiritual application of metaphoric language, sure. Sure, yeah. Yeah. So with that's what we mean by marriage. We're not gonna be having consummation marriage sex with Yeshua. It's a it's basically we're saying in order for someone to be married to something or to someone, uh, if you're the wife, you submit. And if you're the husband, you sacrifice for it's that's the premise laid out in all of scripture. I think something that stands out to me most about the idea of us being given in marriage at all in the resurrection is Matthew 22, 30, Mark 12, 25 and Luke 20, 34 and 35, where Yeshua specifically addresses. And you and I had talked about this before in comments before, Tony, where uh, he says that in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. And to me, and I remember you saying, uh, I forget exactly your points on it, but I thought that it distinguished that we're, we're not going to marry and nobody's giving us into marriage. It's like he reiterates it. And he, go ahead. You, the, with the context of that, he's they're asking him about us marrying each other. He answers them in that context. You're not so, marrying each other. But but you're saying that you we marry Jesus. We uh, go fall under his headship. Well, that's we submit to him. We, OK, yeah. so here let's just look at the covenant language. All right. If Yeshua is the king of Israel. Mm -hmm. And all of us grafted in through faith and belief are Israel as well. Are we all in agreement on that? Yes. Okay. So then you're saying at the resurrection, I'm not going to be marrying any other people for procreation's sake, but instead I marry my king. Am I not already under his authority and headship right now, even before my that, resurrection? And when you got to go back to the, the Hebrew mar marriage ceremony, that is a period called betrothal, not marriage. A woman is still under his authority during betrothal, but not at. And so I'm not in covenant with Yeshua day. right now. You you are betrothal. It's still, it's all one big covenant. Those who were in a uh, betrothal process were actually considered as if they were married even before the consummation mm -hmm. of the marriage happened, and so right. that's why the significant language of Second Corinthians eleven one through three is. I wish you would bear with me a little foolishness. Do bear with me, for I feel divine jealousy for you. Since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Um, and uh, so, wait, so now Paul betrothed us and not our own volition. So the betrothal is in through faith. In so if we have faith in him, you know, that's that's when we start our faith walk. And I'm assuming Paul is sharing the gospel with these people. And so in a way, you know, Paul is, you know, kind of liking himself to introducing this this relationship because he's sharing the gospel with these people, right? So if 
if he's saying, I betrothed you to one husband, what's the one husband he's referring to, to present you as a pure virgin, which is all about the undefiled spiritual nature of people that have submitted themselves to the, the, you know, the faith, you know, to Christ. So the question is, is in second Corinthians, you know, Paul's making this analogy that we're talking about is he's betrothed us to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. And, uh, and, and so whenever we're talking about this uh, ancient Middle Eastern ketubah process, um, uh, Tony, maybe you want to share kind of a breakdown on, on like the, how, you know, the, the bra the groom would go to prepare a place for the woman. And yeah. so the church is referred to throughout the Old Testament, you know, as a woman, you know, the, the bride, uh, you know, talked about in Jeremiah, um, the woman, the whoring woman or the, the woman of Zion that was righteous, you know, the people are always used as this analogy of, you know, the, these are the people that Yah, our creator is making a, a covenant with. And whenever they act whorishly is when they're going in, uh, into idolatry. And so that's why it's so, you know, applicable. Uh, Jake, are, that, Jake, are you referring to Jeremiah 3, 8? So Jeremiah three, uh, talking to, or three one, you know, it says God says if a husband divorces his wife and she goes from him and belongs to another man, will he still return to her? Yet not the land be completely polluted. But you are a harlot with many lovers. Yet you return to me. You know Jeremiah three one says God is using a husband divorcing his wife analogy here. So there has to be an applicable you know thing that he in the past. But he took them you know, back. Uh, yes, yes, he has taken them back, but we we That's can't. The point of Hosea, the whole the whole point of Hosea is he says even though you you know you've played the harlot, you're still going to come back to me, which is which is what we're talking about is it's not a marriage just to the New Jerusalem, it's a marriage to the people that are willing to be part of the New Jerusalem that are that are also in the New Jerusalem. It's a it's a covenant language of those who will obey, and if they obey, they get the blessing, which is you know you know, what Yah promises us, the promises the inheritance. Of, of inheritance of the promises of living in the land and the impromptu. So the, pr the problem with your guys's position is that how are we separating the, the children of Israel and those who are in covenant with the most high from, from the marriage analogy? Like what, what's the benefit of removing this like, so, I mean, Jeremiah pretty ex explicit. Maybe you can break me through your understanding of Jeremiah 3 1. Why would God say he's a husband that's divorcing his wife? He doesn't. He's He says if a husband divorces his wife, he's given the principle. So he's making the analogy, though. He's, he's making an analogy between a husband and wife and the, and the, the process involved of, of a wayward wife, and the, ha the husband would not take her back. But that's an earthly man. Yahweh is sits on the mercy seat and he tells you further down in the same chapter 11 14 yeah he tells you further down uh israel said to me faithless israel has proved herself more righteous than treacherous judah now of course he's talking about the two different houses here he goes on to say go and proclaim these words to the north and say return faithless israel declares the lord i will not look upon you in anger for i am gracious declares the lord i will not be angry forever only yeah. acknowledge your iniquity which means to repent come back into covenant behavior that you have transgressed against the lord your god and you've scattered your favors to the strangers over every green tree. You have not obeyed my voice. Return, O faithless sons, declares the Lord. I'm a master to you. I will take you one from a city and two for a family. I'll bring you to Zion. If you return. So I guess my question here is then what what happened when you, you guys are saying, according to Jeremiah 3 here, he divorced. The father divorced Israel. Mm -hmm. So then what, were they divorced, though, from the covenant, according to y'all's understanding? So they, there's always going to be remnants throughout history that continue to keep the commandments. Yeah. Um, but those that refuse to keep the commandments, he's divorcing them from his, you know, he, he's, he's kicking them out of the land. You know, they have the curses fall on them. They're going into captivity. You know, that's, that's why there's this analogy because they're the ones seeking out other gods. And so, you know, that's why he likens the, the whole analogy of the book of Hosea is, is this woman who continually is playing the harlot yet is bought back by this insurmountable price by Hosea. Who's like, you know, I'll, I'll take this woman when nobody else would buy her. 
And it's the whole premise of how Yah's relationship with us is, is that despite our forefathers and even us going out and, and playing the harlot in terms of idolatry, he's still willing to receive us back in covenant. Um, and, and that's because of the mediation mm. and, and uh, the, the headship and priesthood of the Messiah. So, so wait a minute, you just, you just said he's willing to, to bring us back or buy us back according to the Hosea analogy because of the headship mediation of Yeshua as our high priest. But that didn't happen for 700 years after Jeremiah made this statement. Before the foundations of the earth. So people of the well, Old Testament no. are saved. <laughs> he saved. wasn't the high priest before the foundations of the earth. He's only a high priest upon his appointment after his ascension to the right hand of the Father. That's what's prophesied of him. Resurrection. And that's where, that's where the mediation comes from, is when he's made high priest. So... We're, we have a 700 year time gap here from, from what you just said, as far as he, he buys back the people that are repentance only through Yeshua's mediation. That, that leaves a 700 year gap where what happens with so, those people during that time. So you don't, you don't believe that the blood of the Messiah at Calvary covers the sins in the past of everyone that came before him. I, I believe, of course, you, the, just well, like then, Romans, Romans four explains Abraham. But what yeah. I'm saying though is this is this is where we're getting into the meat of what we've heard from this particular doctrine being spread around. That literally is one of the most popular teachings amongst the Torah observant crowd. That that Israel couldn't come back into covenant. That Judah wasn't divorced, but Israel was. The Northern House was, and they couldn't come back into covenant for 700 years until you should. Well, I there's all. I'm not. I don't say that. It says right there. He keeps telling him to come back. Come, come back to me. Then Tony, you are the minority from other people that hold this this doctrine. Oh, okay. Well, I, I I I know you're referring to your identity crisis averted teaching, right? Um, that's not my but, teaching. the whole The whole point of that title was that's a very popular teaching that's passed around amongst the Torah observant crowd. That's promoted by folks with large large audiences, and well, this is the uh, prominent theory that's spoken. Well, if maybe I could share my own understanding of that identity crisis teaching and and uh, and kind of what I've gotten from your perspective, you know, that the punishment that came to the northern house of Israel was the curses of Leviticus, you know, that they would forget their identity as the chosen of the most high. And so that's why we have a reference reference in Romans eleven twenty five, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. The blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. So this is not about the unredeemable nature of those that were of the Northern house after the Assyrian captivity. It, it's about their blindness. The whole premise of, from my understanding, the identity crisis teaching is that those who rejected the covenant ways broke the sabbatical years. They didn't keep the commandments. They, they yeah, received the curses of Leviticus um, and because they didn't repent, furthermore, curses were placed on them. And, and it's the blindness that's coming to end, not the ability of people to come into covenant with the most high, because there's always a remnant of people throughout scripture that when they repent, he has mercy on them. Um, we see, you know, you know, he Hezekiah, uh, he, he had a Passover and many people came that were from these northern houses, but we can assume that they were all, you know, trying to be obedient to the Torah. They were trying to remain in covenant and, and to keep his ways. But so, it's the blindness that is what we're talking yeah. about with the identity crisis is that it's not not being able to be in covenant or not being able to be saved pre yeah. resur you know, resurrection, but rather their ability to wake up to their identity as the chosen of the most high and to repent of their sins and to come back. Jake, so, do you realize that you're not, no one says what you just said. No one teaches that, brother. Oh, uh, okay. Well, that's how uh, I, took, that's how I, I took just, it too, yeah, though. man. I'm just letting you know, like the people that promote the the identity crisis teaching that God divorced Israel, they they do not explain any of that. They don't say any of that. They don't believe any of that. What you guys just explained, and I'm and I'm happy to hear that you guys have said those kind of concepts. To be honest with me, to, to be honest with you, but that's not what the majority of people take away from this teaching. That's not what they think or understand, and that's not what other teachers promote about this teaching. Well, uh, the vast majority of what the identity crisis teaching put forward is the whole premise that, you know, Ezekiel laying on his side, the 390 days represented the amount of punishment that were to come to the house of Israel. And that because they didn't repent at the end of that 390 years, that if we read through Leviticus, we see that he, he pretty clearly says, I will, you know, 
put your sins upon you by seven. Like he, he multiplies the punishment is what, what is kind of inferred out of that Leviticus text. And so the premise being that the blindness that Paul is talking about in Romans um, is simply the ability of people to repent, the ability of people to know that they're living in wickedness. And so the, in a way, it does kind of correlate with the ability to be in covenant or not, because we know that if you keep his commandments and you you know keep to the faith of the Messiah, you know, you're in covenant with the most high, you know, mm-hmm. by just action, by, by in faith, walking out your faith, according to the book of James. So and then, so I'm asking real quick, then what were they divorced from? If they if you agree, they weren't divorced from the covenant. From the blessings. From, from the blessings, which included being in the land, which, you know. That's the main point I think I keep seeing is that you read a lot of verses earlier that talks about land and, and being scattered from the land. And that the promises of staying in covenant are being able to stay in the land. Whereas the land that we now look forward to would be the New Jerusalem. I thought it interesting also when I looked up like some archaic spell uh, meanings of like husbandry, that it meant attending the land was the husband and archaic. Yeah. And just real quick, uh, we have a comment in the audience that says, uh, Miss Karen's asking why we aren't talking about other people, what other people believe. Isn't this a discussion between the brothers here today? That's what I was thinking. (laughs) Well, sure. Sure. Tony. But the point is you guys were trying to bring on a third participant today who has directly taught what I just said. So uh, so that, that means that you guys, the two of you would disagree with the person that you're going to be bringing on as a part of this discussion today, because he does hold that mainstream teaching narrative and has been teaching it for almost 10 years. So this is why I'm, you know, I, I understand Karen, your, your, your thought of why you would think, well, wait a minute, why is Sean talking about this? If that's why I said at the very beginning of this discussion, I wanted you guys to lay out your case. So we do not misunderstand what you're saying. Cause now we're discovering that you two actually disagree with someone you almost had as another guest on with you. Very much so, apparently, Either you, you know, <laughs> because that that mainstream teaching teaches that the house of Israel was divorced for 700 years out of covenant and could not come back in covenant till Yeshua died. That's that teaching. And that's been passed around in abundance that, everywhere. That makes no sense. That's, that's well, people. Sure people are even no there's sense. even people in the comments and the chats talking about it. So this well, is in a way, if you if you look at, you know, what what you're talking about, the inheritance is what they lose when they transgress the law. Right. Mm -hmm. And so in the way, when it talks about them being divorced from the covenants, the expulsion happened, they're kicked out of the land and they lose their inheritance. The tribe, the 12, the 10 Northern tribes, they lost their ability to have that inheritance in the land. So respectfully, brother, they, it doesn't say they were divorced from the covenant. That's the point that Wes and I are trying to make is that it says that they were scattered from the land. And this was what was prophesied in Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 4, Judges 2, a whole bunch of places. They would be, the moment they disobeyed, and I'm agreeing with you, Deuteronomy 28, right? The blessings and the curses. The moment that they disobeyed and went outside of covenant behavior, now they're going to get all these curses. And those curses are going to compile in Leviticus 26 to the point of they'll be scattered out of the land. um, And it's going to get really nasty until right before they're scattered out of the land, as we see in the days of Isaiah. Um, So, we agree with you guys. It's it's just not, there is no statement in the scriptures that says that I will divorce you from covenant. In fact, in those passages mm-hmm. that I just previously referenced, Yahweh explicitly says over and over again, I will not break covenant with you. Judges 2, 1, I will never break covenant. I will never break covenant. Right. We, yeah, but we we did it. As no, humans, no. we did it. Uh, yeah. And he, well, that's Hebrews, what, 8, Hebrews, Hebrews 8, 7 says, for if that first covenant had been faultless, blameless, you, or done correctly, there should have been no place sought for the second. And that's, that's on us. He's not going to break it. He is perfect. Yeah. Respectfully, Hebrews is a totally different bag of worms as far as, because you're, you're talking about a juxtaposition of priesthoods in that, in that chapter. So I, all I'm trying to say is, and by the way, I go look at the text in Hebrews and look at all the italicized yeah, words, because there's italicized words included in those texts with the word covenant specifically that changes the whole meaning of that passage. And if we get into when the new covenant begins, it's going to be a whole new bag of worms, too. Yeah, yeah. The new the new covenant isn't here yet. Okay, good. Yeah, well, we agree with that. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, I, everyone would have to know who he is. That's right, and, and they don't. But for us, yeah. we don't. Yeah. Which is I why. Mean, this but if you look at if you go to prophet. verse eight, if you go to verse eight, he is talking about the covenant with Judah and Israel. He says, "For finding fault with them, again, it's we did it as 
humans, we broke the covenant. You're in, you're in Hebrews 8? Is that what you are? Where you are? Yeah, Hebrews 8, 7, and 8. Yeah. You, and now, um, you know you're talking about the priesthood right there. You're talking about the Levite it, priests in that it's, moment. No, it's in the whole a lot of concept. A lot of context, it's, brother. You got to read from chapter 7 through chapter 8 and 9. It's talking about the Hebrew priests. And the whole thing is juxtaposing Yeshua versus the faulty Hebrew priesthood of the Levites. Levite versus Melchizedek. A lot right, of but this is also referring to the new covenant that we said isn't here yet. Like, right. That's is, why it's mm -hmm. inner. It, it, just because it's mentioning priests around it doesn't mean that this is talking only about the priesthood. It affects it directly affects the priesthood. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's uh, subjectively just only about priesthood. So he says, for finding fault with them, behold, the, the days come, saith the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So he's still referencing the the first one here and it's all it's all interlocked it's all inner it's all holding hands the priesthood holds hands with the covenant of course yeah to. that's what i put on screen here we got uh, Ruben is saying man this is getting deep and this it, it does guys this is the problem with this conversation why there's so much misunderstanding on both sides of people that because like we you guys came on today and I had no clue that you believe what you believe. That's why I wanted you guys to explain it to us. Yeah. Now and then it, we come to find out you actually don't believe what the mainstream teaching of this is and what's passed around everywhere uh, for 10 years now. So cool. That's wonderful. But at the same time, you're tying in Trinitarian ideas with this. You're tying in, you know, ideas of, of priesthood and covenant with this that some people don't hold specifically. You're tying in pre-incarnate Yeshua's everywhere in the Old Testament theology, Christology, which a lot of people don't agree with. So th this particular topic is a huge topic. That's why I was so happy that you guys were actually yeah. willing to talk with us, like like mature it, men, about this. Because there. you'd be surprised how many people I've asked to actually talk with me about this. Because I, it's like I don't think maybe they get scared knowing how many other things play into this topic. Yeah. And and trying to weed through all the misconceptions patiently is really requires fruit of the spirit. So I want to commend both of you for yeah. that. Absolutely. Yeah. And and you guys too. We finally got to do this. This was right. So do like, you guys do uh do you Tony, Jake, do you guys feel do you guys feel competent and that we understand your position? Um uh, if yeah. No. <laughs> I, ish, I'll say ish. I'll be honest, Not, saying that I I'm not at a, at a fullness of understanding of all of this, let alone y'all's position. So I I, <laughs> I know about what I've read so far, and it, it's making sense to me that I, I'd love to talk about Second Ezra seven when we get a chance. Do you guys yeah. uh, like? Are y'all aware that that Yeshua quotes from Second Ezra's and that, that it has some validity to it? Yeah, yeah. very yeah. good book. Yeah. Awesome. So there's a passage in. Uh, one yep. second, Wes, I'll pull it up. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind. And um, I guess it depends on what translation you might be looking at, but zoom it on in. Yeah, that's what I say. I'm like, am I, I, I'm, all, I'm only 40. I should, <laughs> be able to, I should be able to read that. <laughs> uh, I'd like to start at like verse 26, if you don't mind, or sure. earlier. So behold, the time shall come um, that these tokens, which I have told thee, shall come to pass, and the bride shall appear, and she coming forth shall be seen, that now is withdrawn from the earth, and whosoever is delivered from the force that evil shall see my wonders. So we see the bride mentioned, and this is spoken about 400 years before Christ, correct? And Probably. so we see we see the new Jerusalem being called the bride. Well, I say it's the new Jerusalem because it says there well, it tells you in chapter two also. Does it, that, thank you. But it, it says right there that it's withdrawn now at that point when he's saying that he says, behold, the time shall come. And then he says, the bride will appear. What, what chapter is that? Seven, second Ezra seven. So behold, the time will come and the bride will appear, which now is withdrawn from the earth. Yep. So this is before anyone's inhabiting the bride. It's still desolate. That's why she's called the desolate woman in Isaiah. Because she's without children. This is why in Isaiah 66, it's such a big deal for an entire nation to be born in a single day. And this is why she says, who has reared these children? This is why Zion is speaking as an actual personified character all throughout Isaiah. In fact, let's let's just take this moment real quick because we're already here at an hour 25 and we really haven't presented much of our case, Wes. Okay. Um, this is still talking about people. 
If you, if you, if you, Esdras, yeah. This is talking about when the people get taken out to come back. Well, no, it's, this is what this is what I was trying to say from chapter two to chapter seven. It introduces the kingdom. This is why I have it highlighted here on the screen. This okay. is what what through an angel the Lord is telling Ezra, and that angel is 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 the person that showed up to him to give this message. Tell my people, I'll give them the kingdom of Jerusalem, which I was to give to Israel. So what does that okay. mean? This is during the days of Ezra. He's saying, tell my people, I would, I will give them the kingdom of Jerusalem, which I was going to give to Israel. Didn't Israel already possess the kingdom? Didn't they be taken into the land after the Exodus? He's talking about the new Jerusalem. This is the bride. He says, moreover, I will take, to, take back to myself their glory, and I will give to these others the everlasting habitations, which I had prepared for Israel, right? The fullness of the Gentiles that would come in. Yeshua, the tree of life shall give them fragrant perfume. So now we know specifically what he's talking about. Yep. The, tree of, the tree of life wasn't on the ground during the days of the kingdom of Israel, Correct. of what's called daughter Jerusalem and Isaiah. He says, ask and you will receive, pay that your dreams will be few, that you may be shortened. The kingdom is already prepared for you. Watch. So this is a, this is a part and he goes on in further parts of chapter two to explain more, but then it leads up to a whole bunch of stuff. And then chapter seven, he actually calls the, the bride, which you saw, which is now withdrawn from the earth. And that's what I was about to ask. So reading in Second Ezra, in twenty-eight, it says, "For my son, the Messiah, shall be revealed with those who are with him, and those who remain shall rejoice for four hundred years." Every, right. Well, within four hundred years, depends on the passage you're reading. Right. Yeah. It's it's right. saying it's talking about people. When it says, no, that's that's what it's, it it even the translation I had on screen. I'm trying to go back to it. It says the city that you saw. Which is the one that's now disclosed? No, I'm yeah, it's, it's, it. it's the land that is hidden shall now be disclosed. Everyone right. who has been delivered from the evils that I have foretold shall see my wonders. Yes, you know what that is? That is the kingdom. Son, for my son, the Messiah, shall mm -hmm. be revealed mm -hmm. with those who are with him. Okay, so it's talking about people. This when when it this says is, withdrawn from the earth now withdrawn. Um, it, do you believe that people were withdrawn from the earth at that point, 400 years before Christ? Well, I, I think it's tied to the whole premise of he's going to prepare a place for us. Like in John 14, three, you know, that's why the betrothal process is applicable to the return of the Messiah, because he's going to prepare a place for us and he comes back with that abode. Right. And so why is he going to prepare a place for, for us, well, it's because we're going to be dwelling in the New Jerusalem with him, and so that's why, like the analogy of you know the the ketuba and the betro near Near East betrothal process is, you know, is something that we can place on top of these scriptures. Is that he's literally describing going and preparing this New Jerusalem as the abode for him and the elect. Now, here's a question: Who prepared the city? Who prepared? If the city's the bride, who prepared it? But it's actually the former Garden of Eden. No, I'm saying, I mean, who who's preparing it right now? Well, Yeshua tells us that he goes to prepare a place for us in John 14. Okay. Well, then but the kingdom, the, the kingdom is already prepared. Okay. This, this is the new the return of the Garden of Eden is the New Jerusalem, guys. And in right. fact, I'm, I got the verses on screen to help us walk through this idea. Yeah, so, I'm what is he going to prepare then? No, wait, 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 wait. I have to I have to sum this up, please. Uh, if he if he's preparing it then what does Revelation 19, uh, 7, 9 talk 19th. about where it says the bride has made herself ready? That's the exact verses I was going to in Isaiah. Sweet. You guys want us to lay our case out? Yeah. Okay. You ready? Verse 14, Isaiah 49. We'll keep reading past it. But Zion said, that's not the people. That's not the Father. That's not the Holy Spirit. Zion said, this is the personification of the city talking. Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. And this is obviously the father talking back to Zion. Behold, I've inscribed you on the palm of my hands. This is actually spoken about in Second Ezra chapter 2 as well. He says, your walls are continually before me. Your builders hurry. Your destroyers and devastators will depart from you. That's the wicked and unfa the faithless that are removed and scattered from from. The, the land of promise is lift up your eyes and look around. All of them gather to you. Let me highlight this for folks to read with me. Um, 
He says, lift up your eyes and look around. All of them gather to you. They come to you. As I live, declares the Lord, you will surely put all of them on as jewels and bind them on as a bride. This is a direct correlation of how the people go into the city who is the bride. And this is the same metaphor of the people being referred to as jewels, not the bride. So this is why when we go to Revelation 19, 7, that's why that's how the bride makes herself ready. Is she is receives the resurrected saints of the first resurrection. Let us rejoice and be glad, give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Why? Because all of this stuff is happening after Revelation 9, Revelation 11, which is the seventh trumpet, the last trumpet, which is the first resurrection event. According to Isaiah 27, 12, and 13, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, 1 Corinthians 15, 15, and 1, and Revelation 11, 11 through 15. The last trumpet is the resurrection moment. This is where the people are taken to the bride and stowed away during the wrath of the Lamb. And this is how the bride makes herself ready. Once Yeshua was done fighting, then the city has been descending. And so this is where we go back to, we'll go back to Isaiah. So are you, so you're taking that as a bride doth, doeth, literally, not as like a, you're going to put them on like how a bride would put on these ornaments. When the Revelation 21 says, I'll show you the wife and the bride of the lamb. And it says, oh, it's the new Jerusalem. It's the city of God coming down out of heaven. I do take that literally. Same thing with Isaiah 49, where it says your inhabitants who will be brought to you, will be bound, bind on you as jewels are bound on a bride. You're taking that literally, like you're taking that, making her the bride, not a description. It, it literally says she's the bride. No, Just it, like it, it, in Revelation the, 21. You're being adorned on her yeah. as a bride does. That's right. Not, just that's why it's a consistent metaphor because we're all dealing with metaphors. We're just trying to parcel out which metaphor applies to who. It's right. a consistent metaphor between Isaiah 49, the passage I just showed, with mm -hmm. Revelation 19 and Revelation 21 and 2nd Ezra 7. And if we continue going back, this is the quick moment here in Isaiah 26. Remember, because the bride has already made herself ready. Why? Because the first resurrection event has already taken place. And this is what is told to us right here in Isaiah 26, 19 to 21. The dead will live. They'll rise, wake from the dust of the earth. The earth will give birth to departed spirits. Verse 20, come, my people, enter into your rooms and close your doors behind you. Hide for a little while until indignation runs its course. For behold, the Lord's about to come out from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, and the earth will reveal her bloodshed and will no longer cover her slain. So this is all in Isaiah. And then we go to Isaiah 60. Do you want to, let's go to Isaiah 62 real quick. Still talking about Zion. The father still promising good things to Zion. And we'll start in verses one through five. It says, for Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not keep quiet until her righteousness goes forth like brightness and her salvation like a torch that is burning. The nations will see your righteousness and all the kings your glory, and you will be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will designate. Also, you'll be a royal crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. It will no longer be said to you forsaken, nor to your land will it any longer be said desolate. But you will be called, my delight is in her, and your land married. There's two Whoa. definitions of the word married. One is to rule over. You're, we'll get to verse five, though. For the Lord delights in you, and to him your land will be married. Beulah and Tibael. And this is the word Beulah. We, we can look it up in a minute. Verse five, for as a young man marries a virgin, so your sons will marry you. And as the so, bridegroom, the bridegroom, we all know who that is, rejoices over the bride. So your God, your Elohim, Yeshua, will rejoice over you. Which Mary is in verse five? I mean, I can look it up. It, it, I mean, the context still tells you what's talking about, but we'll look it up together. I mean, I, I say both of them are. Some, this has to be something metaphorical because. If, here, here you go, brother. If, if we're being referred to as uh, referred to that New Jerusalem mother, then saying the sons are going to marry their mother still against Torah, like there's it's a metaphor, just like you yes, said, right? Yes, yes, metaphorical. Like right. everything is metaphorical. Right, and, but, but there's but there's a parceling out. Of course. This is why it literally tells you in the metaphor of who Yeshua's bride is. It's the city. Which that's where he ju it just says in Isaiah sixty two verse four and five. Yes, this is that was the point of this whole passage. Just talking to Zion, to him your land will be married. Your God will rejoice over you as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. 
your sons will marry you. That's us. That's us. This is what, think about the Matthew 22, the marriage supper of the lamb. Are you the bride or are you the wedding guest in that moment? Uh, I don't, I'm not the judge of that. He well, the text, the, tells that. You. Te well the, the text tells you really. I mean, the whole the, dichotomy the between the wedding guests and the bride, um, it can kind of be drawn out of, uh, like the first, the, the churches in revelation where there's six churches that have not, or four, five churches that haven't prepared themselves. Right. And so, uh, they have to go through tribulation, but then the church of Philadelphia is promised to be escaping the hour of tribulation, uh, which seems to be synonymous with the woman in revelation 12, that's brought into the wilderness and nurtured for, a you know, in revelation 12, the woman that's nurtured in the wilderness. And so, you know, is there a dichotomy between believers that are in, uh, sin and still have things to be weeded out from them when tribulation comes and those that have made themselves ready in advance. Is there a dichotomy between how they're treated in, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, in times playing out and, and during, uh, um, you know, the, the tribulation, like how, you know, how people are treated is based on how they prepare themselves according to God's commandments. And so, you know, the language of like revelation 12, indicates like those the the woman seems to be likened to this church of philadelphia that escapes the hour of tribulation and uh and that's why this woman language can also seem to indicate like this is the people that are given that you know amazing you know blessing of of being either you know the hundred forty four thousand or 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 you know however you know we want to fall on those you know that different topic but um there seems to be a dichotomy between how people are treated in the kingdom um based on how they've aligned their hearts to the most high. So uh, is everyone become the wedding guest or are those who are closest presented this opportunity to be, you know, you know, the bride and Why then the rest of the best man. Well, it doesn't mean that he can't be also metaphorically a bride in terms let's of how go. he submits himself to the most high, like let's, into to Yeshua. That's a good question, Jake. Let's go there. Um, and so we'll, we'll look at this from, while, while you're looking that up, I think this is a good time to, one, thank you again for having this talk. Like yeah. I, just, I think this has really been really good. Yeah. Uh, two, um, I, I, like the first thing I said it is, is where you have, there's lots of verses that show that uh, allude to the New Jerusalem and even some set stating it that being the bride. And there's a lot that allude and state that the people are the bride. And this which is why ones, I think. Which ones state the people are the other bride? Well, the same, it's all metaphor because the, like this, the same verses that you're using to say that the new Jerusalem is the bride. But, but let's here's make a partial. Here's where we get into the Trinitarian conversation. You guys okay. ready? Because the verses you read earlier from Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Hosea, even Isaiah. Oh, no, I'm thinking like Ephesians 5. Well, in Ephesians 5, it says that God is over Yeshua, just like Yeshua is, is a husband over the church. So right. there's still a hierarchy there. Right. But in ancient Israel, the way we're scattered because they stopped doing covenant behavior and the language of divorce was spoken amongst the people in a scattering because it was a, an agreement of covenant between the father, the almighty Yahweh with the people. So Yeshua is a part of the people. He's the king of Israel. He's not the almighty. So therefore, if the, the people in the Old Testament are metaphorically referred to as a bride to the father, he, he then Yeshua be becomes one of the people. That's literally why he was birthed as a part of, of mankind. And then he is resurrected, glorified for mankind as a new creation. This is why Hebrews 5, 1 through 5 tells us that high priest has to be chosen from amongst his brethren to represent them in matters pertaining to God. Right. It's half well, that's, that's my whole point with the word <laughs> yeah. throughout the, all the scripture. Yeah, hang on, hang on, guys. Word. Making the covenant. What I'm saying is you're mixing metaphors. This is a conflation of metaphors. This is where the point, this is where a lot of people get tripped up because in the old Testament, all the almighty father made an agreement with Israel that they would be in covenant terms. Israel, through his word, it, through his word, he made the his, covenant is my, but point. You're, you're, this is where I asked for those scriptures and all of those scriptures that you're assuming. We actually have other scriptures that tell us literally those were angels communicating that word and not the pre-incarnate Yeshua. So this is where we run into a, a unique, you know, speed bump with it's assuming Trinitarian ideals. It's actually more of a oneness ideal. 
it's assuming this concept that Yeshua is everywhere in the Old Testament and he's the same person as the Father. Therefore, when Yeshua marries someone in the New Testament, it, therefore it must be the people because God metaphorically likened himself in covenant marriage to the people. But that's not the, 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 the distinction, the differentiation of Yeshua is that he's the son of God, not the father, and he is the bridegroom, not the father. In a high priest right. mediator. You're, you're at it from, from the clay side, not the, like, we're all clay and we're trying to, we're on that potter's line trying to discuss what's on the other side. We're just looking at the they, scriptures, brother. Yeah, we're just I, talking about what the words say. Right, but in a, they can be the same and separate simultaneously that's not what it the is. word says brother no it, it says that the father is unbegotten right. the son is begotten right but he was always was begotten wouldn't would entail that he was not always uh, before creation of the world right but he was with god he was with elohim and he was elohim right what's well, elohim mean what, yes that's what we were asking you to, to give your definition of, of elohim it's earlier the God, what we call God. So the strongest concordance defines Elohim as, as a divine spirit kind or a spirit being, which is why the father can call his son God, like he did in, in Psalms and Hebrew. Did you yeah. guys know that, that Yahweh calls Yeshua God in Psalm 45, 6, and 7? And that's what's being repeated in Hebrews 8 or Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. Because he is. But he's the son. Because the word but God applies to the, again, to, the, to the nature again, of the word Elohim. You're looking at it. You're looking at it from our binary realm no, we live in. I'm looking There's at it from quantum the relations. Words. I'm, I'm looking at the definitions of the words, brother. Right, but at, and if you look at um, where when Yeshua said he was the Son, the, the word he God, made himself equal to him. What, no, no, that. What we're, I'm, I'm just going to say this as a person that has children. I can look at my daughter and I see myself. That is myself. Well, you sure there's a semblance. Sure, a physical semblance. Yeah, this is what Hebrew. No, 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 one. no, no. I mean, like Three literally, three it is my DNA. They no, are made that. from. I hear that. Yeah, but it's not so the that... same. Your your daughter and your children are not the same entity as you. They breathe different air. They have different biological systems. They're not the same entity as you. They'll die at different times. Then, so then the why point... did they try to stone Yeshua for making himself equal with God by saying he's the son? That was the claim and the slander of the Pharisees who were always lying about Yeshua to kill him. So I'm not going to take their word for their misunderstanding of doctrine for him because Yeshua himself tells us in John 17, 4 and 5, that he came to show who the Father is, that he's the Father is the one true God, the one true ruler. And that's what that word God is used as in the Old Testament Greek, Hebrew and in the New Testament Greek. It's not just the Almighty. It's someone that is a divine spiritual being who is a ruler. Right. The so angels are called Elohim. Moses is called Elohim. This anyone that can be have that position of rulership can be use the term God. You have to look at the context of how it's being used. So, for example, when Yeshua tells us in John 20, 20 that he returns back to you know Mary's God and his God, just like Jake brought up in Revelation 3 12 a minute ago, that Yeshua tells us he'll make us a pillar in the temple of his God. Yeshua There's a huge called. differentiation. So the the, the father. God likened himself in metaphor to Israel as his, as a as a faithless wife in the Old Testament, but the son, the bridegroom, is promised to go into covenant Isaiah sixty two four and five with the city with Zion, just like the resurrected saints are, because he is our he's the firstborn among many brethren, right? He's the leader of us. He's our our king, our lord. He's not, yeah, but he doesn't have an earthly father. That doesn't have any bearing on what I just said. It it does. He's not 100% human or else he would not have been able to. Okay. So now you're, this is truly where you're pull, pushing in Trinitarian ideals to say that he was birthed from a woman, but mm -hmm. therefore he was not God or that he had to be part God and part man in order for him to do what he did. This is where right. his priesthood would disagree with you. And the laws of Hebrew, everything that Hebrews explains to us would disagree with you. It literally says that, a man must be chosen from amongst men to represent other men on matters pertaining to God. Paul repeats this in 1 Timothy 2.5 where he says, There's one God and there's one man, Jesus Christ, who mediates between God and mankind. Mm -hmm. Now, right now, Yeshua has been glorified, so he's a resurrected, glorified man. He's greater than, every other, than the mortal flesh. He's now got a spiritual body again. But he's not the Father. He's mediating to the Father. 
and he came from the Father. This is also what we see in Enoch chapter 48, 1 through 7, where the Son of Man was named by the Lord of Spirits before the sun, moon, and stars are created in the presence of all the angels. He was mm -hmm. he was there, just like you Enoch right. sees him, just like Daniel sees him in Daniel 7, 13 and 14. He sees two different characters. The sun was sent, and I'll put this on screen, guys. This is a huge point of understanding. The sun was sent, not the father. So this is this is where we're mixing the metaphors because it says I the mean, father sent his son to be the savior of the world. That's the bridegroom. And then the bridegroom, his his wife and his his uh, marriage is told to us to be the city. That covenant he goes into is with the land of promise. That's who he leads us into with, with him, into this land of promise. That's why Isaiah chapter 62, 4 and 5, said that the it, your Elohim will rejoice over you and delight in you. That's Yeshua is the is the king of the new Jerusalem. That's the position that's been granted to him through the prophets. What's appointed over him is Psalm 2, 7 through 12. As well as the resurrected saints, because he brings us with, that's how we're presented to Christ. Just like in the Torah, everyone who is spotless and clean presented themselves to the priest so they so the priest could then turn and present them to the Father. That's the process of the Torah that Yeshua is enacting for us. This is why Isaiah 62, 4 and 5 says that us, the sons of the city, and the God of the city, Yeshua, are both entering into covenant with the city because she's our inheritance. So other than the, those instances in, in Enoch, are there any other examples of pre-existence that you guys would point to? Psalm like, is it, so like, how do we know that it wasn't Yahusha, you know, mediating at the Mount Sinai? How do you know? If, you know Jubilees tells us directly it's not. It's a bunch of angels. In fact, the narrator of the book of Jubilees tells you. It's that he was on the one talking to Moses on. on so does morning. Galatians and is Galatians, it Acts? Galatians two nineteen and Acts seven verse fifty three, and also Hebrews two one. Both say that there were angels that mediated the law on Mount Sinai. Mount, um, so one thing that I go to when people ask how how do we know that Yeshua wasn't active and this uh, this you know somebody that interacted with people often is like um, well you you said aside from Enoch so Isaiah forty nine. Uh, verse two, when he says, and he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword in the shadow of his hand, hath he hid me and made me a polished shaft in his quiver, hath he hid me. And that that aligns to me with uh, first Enoch 48, when uh, it's talking about how he was invoked before the ancient of days. And um, there was another one where it, was, it says he was hidden. I believe it's Ephesians. There it is. Which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Like, uh, as familiar with the verse in the end that says that basically Yeshua and Abba kind of live together at the end. Oh, I'm sorry, Tony. Your your signal's breaking up, brother. You're... I know what you're talking about. Enoch 105.2, for I and my son will be united with them forever. Uh, in the well, no, it's in Corinthians. Can you hear me now? Yeah. No, it's Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, 20, and it says, all things shall be subdued unto him. Then shall the Son also be subject to him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So hey, it's literally... Tony, I'm sorry, brother. You're breaking up. I'm getting half your sentences. Oh, sorry. It's uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 28. You mean 20, you to... 25 through 28? Yeah. Okay. I'll put it on screen for us. Yeah, just in case it breaks up. Uh, the verse, the twenty-eight verse, uh, talks about their their power ship coming back together. Actually, it says specifically the son hands over his authority to the father after all the enemies are abolished and sins done away. Right, so that God may be all in all. Right, so the father may be all in all. That's right. That's right. Wait, what? Okay, what word is for use for there? Because sometimes you say the word God, or we say God, you say, "Oh, that's Elohim." What is that? What well, you the, mean? The, the so text. The text distinguishes it for us here. In verse 25, it says, For he must reign, that's Yeshua, until he has put all in his all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that would be abolished is death, for he has put all things in subjection under his feet. This is repeating Psalm 110, 1 through 4. He says, But when he says all things are put in subjection, it's evident that he is expected, is accepted, excuse me, that's Yeshua is accepted from this statement, who put all things in subjection to him. That's the Father. This is why Yeshua tells us, Matthew 28, 18, all authority in heaven and earth is given to him. This is what's prophesied of him when he returns at a second coming, which is what Psalm 110, 1, 1 through 2 says, that I will 
sit at my right hand until I put all your enemies under your feet. And then it even says the son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected right. all things to him. It's That's right. The two different entities being talked about there. So when well, the this, old is, Testament, this is the same word where it uses where it says so that God may be all in all. It is the same word used when it's talking about Yeshua in I think it's Isaiah where it says mighty counselor God with us. Yeah, you know why? It's because the same like we talked about that word God is the rulership. So it depends on the context of what's going on here. In this context in 1 Corinthians 15, it mentions both the Father and the Son, and the Son is under the authority of the Father. He was given his authority by the Father. He's going to give back the authority he was given back to the Father after the yep. end of time. Yep. Isaiah, Isaiah 9, 6 he calls him Wonderful Counselor, Mighty Eternal God, right? Mm -hmm. Everlasting everlasting God, Mighty Eternal Father. Those are positions of rulership that we see throughout the Old Testament. The word God, this is why Psalm 45, 6, and 7, Yahweh speaks of his Son, and calls him God in that passage as a position. That's what's prophesied of the Messiah was that he would be ruler over all things. It's also repeated in Psalm 2, 7 through 12, as well as we see in Psalm in Genesis 45, we see that Jacob speaks to Joseph and Joseph explaining to Jacob that God made him a father over Pharaoh. It's the same language, the same thing in Job 19. Job was a father over the people because he was a ruler over his people. That doesn't mean he's the almighty. The, the prophecy of, of Yeshua in, Psalm, in Isaiah 9, 7 through 9, is that he is made a ruler over the people. It's consistent with Psalm 2, with Psalm 49, with Isaiah 42, with Isaiah 40, 49 and 62. It's consistent with everything in the New Testament. It doesn't mean that he's the Almighty. It means that he is destined and was prophesied to be a ruler over the people. I think what really tripped me up when I was first started looking at these things was that they would capitalize like the F and father and capitalize the H and, and he like to where it kind of confuses you. Like, is it always talking about the father, the almighty father when they capitalize the letter? Apparently not. Yeah. Yeah. It did, that's the, that's the translator decision when they're, when they're crafting the Bible right. and they're, they're trying to get copyright for it. They have, they decide what they're going to capitalize and what they're not. And that yeah. requires their understanding of the context. Beyond. I, I, I guess I was bringing that up to see what your opinion is of the last ver part of 28, so okay. that God may be all in all. What is, is he not all well, in all my, right now? My opinion, not yet. My opinion would be formed from the previous context of the previous four or five verses, which is that Yeshua was given this authority by the Father. That's why he gives it back mm -hmm. to them once all sin is abolished and all his enemies are taken out. And this is at the end yep. of the millennial reign. He gives us, but he's still a high priest forever because a priest does more than just atonement duties. Does all these other sacrifices. He's that for feast days and celebrations, which are eternal. So he's still doing all these other jobs that are assigned to him. That's why it's called a priest forever. But he's not having to take people out in judgment anymore because all sin has been abolished, and everyone that is going to be resurrected will have been resurrected at that point. So there'll be no more sin because everyone's been given a glorified body with an incorruptible heart with his law written on it. So there'll be no more sin after the end of the millennial reign, after Satan's locked away yeah. or. Satan's right. destroyed and, you know, so that's, that's why then he would turn that authority back over to the father at that point. So that, so therefore no more need for mediation because there's, there's no, no more sin or death. That's right. At the and end, so if yeah. we all yeah. come to the father through Yeshua and we are currently in a world filled with sin, doesn't it make sense that Yeshua has always been how the father mediated with mankind since since yeah. he is the inter, you know he's he's the in between yeah. between mankind and you guys you, you guys know. ready he okay through. the way i see it, he rose to his priesthood uh, that he was the only one capable as per hebrews 4 to be able to rise through the heavens to mediate on our behalf in the heavenly sanctuary mm -hmm. to be you know the high priest that he was prophesied to be um and that didn't happen until his death and res resurrection right whereas because he had to earn it, as Hebrews 5, 7 through 10 says. He earned, through his obedience and suffering, he earned this position that was granted to him by the Father, which is this Melchizedek priesthood. Then explain to me how people before the resurrection... I'm, yeah, I got it on screen. You ready? It's on screen for us. It's in the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. It's also in Jubilees as well, but this one's very, very clear. Um, so let's go to... I'm sorry, when I magnified it, it went down a few chapters. Um Hang on, let me unmagnify it real quick. All right. Oh, it's it went all the way back up to Reuben. Jeez. Have you guys read the Testament of the Patriarchs? 
is awesome, man. There's such clear messianic prophecy in this that yeah. it's no wonder they they didn't want it. You know, All right? Yeah, and this is one of the books that they literally said in the first century: stop reading this book. And uh, they when they made their own canon, when they when the Pharisees made their own canon, uh, Enoch, Testament of Twelve Patriarchs, and Jubilees was the the big three. They told people to stop reading. So here in chapter three of the Testament of Levi, the same testament that in five different occasions he says, "I read this in the book of Enoch." He says in chapter three, this is the angel that appeared to Levi to help give him the priesthood, which is validated in Jubilees 33. He says here, therefore, regarding the heavens, which have been shown to you, the lowest is for this cause gloomy unto you that it beholds all the unrighteous deeds of men. And it has fire, snow and ice made ready for the day of judgment. That's repeated in Job 22, by the way. Mm -hmm. And in the righteous judgment of God, for in all of it are the spirits of retributions for vengeance on men. And in the second, that's the second layer of the, the heavens that he was seen are the hosts of the armies which are ordained for the day of judgment. Those are the angels come back with Yeshua on the day of the Lord to work vengeance on the spirits of deceit and of Beliar. And above them are the holy ones. And in the highest of all dwelleth the great glory far above all holiness. This is why Deuteronomy 10, 14 calls Yahweh the most high on the highest heaven, the highest level of the ferment. Verse five, and in the heaven next to it are the archangels who minister and make propitiation to the Lord for all the sins of ignorance of the righteous, offering to the Lord a sweet smelling savior, a reasonable bloodless offering. And in the heaven below this are the angels who bear answers to the angels of the presence of the Lord. And in the heaven next to this are thrones and dominions in which always they offer praise to God. When therefore the Lord looks upon us, all of us are shaken. Yes, the heavens, the earth, the abysses are shaken at the presence of his majesty. But the sons of men, having no perception of these things, sin and provoke the most high. Does verse five say there that we're, we're looking at bloodless offerings happening at the highest heaven? Yeah, well, yeah. even in Torah, you have to have bloodless offerings. Remember, you have to well, yeah, drain, drain the blood out. Right. Yeah. So that was but the point is, this is life. this. All right. So stay with me, guys. This is why in Hebrews chapter five, this is why we're always talking about the priesthood on this channel. It's so important for us to understand what Yeshua is, how and why Yeshua is our high priest. So here is the main point that's been said: is that we have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the Majesty in the heavens and minister in the sanctuary in the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. That's the one in heaven above that we just read about in Testament twelve patriarchs where the angels, before Yeshua was given his high priesthood, the angels were a priesthood that was created to, to help mankind. Part of that job duty, just like just like the Aaron and the Levites, the Levites were underneath Aaron's authority. Aaron was chosen from among the Levites to be a high priest within that realm. Mm -hmm. Just like there's archangels who are likened to a high priest among the other ministering servants of angels who are lesser priests, if you will, in the, in the hierarchy of the realm of heaven above, where they minister on behalf of the sins of the ignorance of, of the unright of the righteous. That means someone that is asking for atonement. That's someone that is coming in repentance to worship God on the earth. And this is why this passage here in Hebrews eight is telling us that what we do on the earth is a copy and a shadow. We're just playing a, we're just playing a stage play down here, guys, mm -hmm. the real tabernacle, the real Ark of the covenant is where Jesus is ministering on our behalf before the father right now. He's doing true Torah on our behalf. This is what first Timothy five literally tells us. That's how he's making propitiation and ministering on our behalf. And it goes on to say in verse three, for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So it's necessary that this high priest, speaking of Yeshua also has something to offer. Now, if he were on the earth, he wouldn't be a priest at all. Since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, that's the Levites. Cause remember they were given the eternal priesthood on the earth. And they serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he's about to wreck the tabernacle. He said, for see, he says that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown to you in the mountain. Moses saw the pattern of what they do in heaven and made a replica of it for them to practice on the earth in this mobile tabernacle. This is why it's called a copy and a shadow. This is why Yeshua had to ascend through the layers of the firmament, Hebrews 4.14, with his glorified resurrected body that can do that. So he could minister in this true tabernacle above. Hebrews 1 7 also calls angels ministering spirits of flame and fire. And so it it just goes to show that like if the job of a high priest is to minister the law and teach the law to the people, then who who was able to do that um, for like Adam and Eve? I know y'all say that you thought it was Yeshua, but that um, Jubilees and then all this other evidence of the angels being called ministers and priests. Uh, seem to indicate otherwise. Well, just going yeah. off of the the language in Genesis seems to be God first person, 
first person from Yah. And that's kind of where at least that doctrine comes from in my perspective is whenever you see him talking in the first person, uh, whether it's from the burning bush or it's from the garden, you know, he's walk, he walks in the midst of the garden. All of this seems to be indicative of the most high, not his, you know, ministering messenger, you know, otherwise, why didn't he say, you know, an angel of the most high was hanging well, out in the well, garden. Why does it, it does. seem to have the first person? He literally does. Associated. Well, that, it does say it's an angel, but I also understand what you're saying there. That I, it, It's often made me want to wonder, are the angels like this conduit where the father's literally just speaking through them? Or what are your thoughts on that, John? Uh, I, I personally think they're, they're angels. <laughs> Yeah. So they, their whole reason that they've been given these tasks is they're entrusted to to remember and know what to do and how to say and represent the Father on His behalf. This is why they're His ministering servants that come out as servants supposed to represent your Master the way He wants you to. So this is why when they're speaking with Abraham and they're speaking in first person, like they they the Father, you know, if if it's not like a, a Wi-Fi download and he's just taking over their mouths, which I, you know, it's possible he could do that, but I don't think that's what's happening. I think instead we have this super intelligent, super righteous, super obedient beings that the father trusts that goes out to speak to Abraham and knows, and the father's already told him he's going to, he's going to rebut this by the way. And he's going to think this and say that here's how you counter it. Here's the message I'm sending with my messengers. It's yeah, that so it's, this is an old concept guys. This is an old, old concept throughout history. It's called agency. It's where a King chooses people to represent him on his behalf. We still use this principle in our, our yeah. everyday life everywhere. It's our secretary yeah. of state. It's yeah. our lawyers. It's everything. These are called agency. I was just thinking of like in, in ancient times when a messenger would have rolled up to somebody's kingdom and he says, hear ye, hear ye. What would he say then? Thus says the king. And then he would read, you know, the right. dictations of the king from first port, from first person, like we see with the angels, I think. Yeah. Right. But to so, me, that's so still like Genesis, the word. So like Genesis 3, 8, where they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, they you're saying that they were hearing the voice of an angel that's called the voice of the Lord God. And yeah, this is actually the presence. For, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And they're actually talking about you're, you're saying they're actually just talking about an angel that's a emissary of the presence of the Lord God. Well, that's that's what the text tells us. This is why it tells us that Yeshua is going to return with the voice of the archangel. It's it's he's going to there's this massive shout that's going to come from a huge angel. Yeshua is busy rallying his other angels coming behind this guy coming down through the ferment uh, on his horse to, to do battle. Same same concept. But I mean, the messengers, the heralds of the authority of the king, they do the heralding. The king. He's the one that has the authority that commands the heralds to go say a message. You, so this you say is, that you say the text says that that there is an angel mm -hmm. called the voice of the Lord. No, I said presence. What, Yeshua returns with the voice of an archangel. To no, that part. No, I'm talking about Genesis, where it says they hid themselves from His presence and they heard where, His well, voice. Let's go to where does it say it it's an angel? Doesn't say that. We'll go there, guys. Let's go here real quick. So let's pardon me real quick. I'll be right back. Okay. So he tells hey, them, guys, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to go here shortly. Uh, my wife needs my internet. So, <laughs> um, uh, maybe if we can wrap up in the next five minutes and you can give your final sure. thoughts or whatever. Sure. Sure. Just there's, you know, there's definitely some Trinitarians in the audience. We, we deal with this for three years now. There's, there's just a, you know, it's it just a, is the way it is. Um, guys, the, the concept of Yahushua being one with the father or Yeshua, however you want to say it is literally what explained to you in John 17, where he says that he, when he prays for all of this, his disciples, which includes us today, that we may be one with them just as he is one with the Father. It doesn't mean they're the same entity. It means they're one in unity and purpose. And that, it literally tells you that in that in that passage in John 17, 21, that we'll be one in unity. Right. right. Yeah. This doesn't mean we're the it's same a being. quantum entanglement. I, respectfully, I would disagree with, with that. It's The words are very clear and distinct, brother. It just says the father sent his son. His son has become our high priest and prays that we would would uh, would enter into discipleship with him so that we can be resurrected and get this glorified body like he did so that we can also have the law written on our heart. And that's how we are one in unity with the father and the son. It says we'll perfectly do Torah from that point on. It's right. the behavior one of the father. One in action is one in character, which is one in authority, which is one right. in name, which is right. one. You are the yeah. same. It's a, it's a had. 
Exactly. But it doesn't mean you're the same biological genetic entity. It just means that you share purpose and, and behavior. Right. You're so, spiritually a cod. Right. That's, yeah, it's yeah. easy. That's, so, what we, that's, what, that's what we mean. When, or at least that's what I mean when I say they're one. I don't okay. think that they are literally identically the same two. Okay. So there I got I got two the that act in the in the fear in the the motive of one. Yep. Yep. So I put on screen here Jake's question and your question as well, Tony, about Genesis. Genesis 3, verse 8. They, Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And you guys are claiming this is Yeshua, yet the text would say Yahweh Elohim in the Hebrew. But we know from Exodus 33, no flesh can hang out with him and live. And this is why. Which is Jesus, why it needs to be the son is our position. Yeah, it doesn't say that. Why, it, doesn't, it doesn't say that. This is why Jubilees 3 tells us the yeah. angels were in the garden communicating to Adam and Eve, teaching them how to behave and teaching them how to live. No, this says they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. Yeah, you, you know that the presence of the Lord God was in the tabernacle through the angel from Exodus 23, the one that followed them, who then descended in Exodus 33 to speak with Moses face to face. The same one that hovered over Leviticus 9 when Nadab and Abihu brought wrong incense and wrong fire and the fire came out from him and destroyed them. It's the same presence of the Lord. It goes through an angel of the presence. That's why oh, these yeah. angels of the presence are called the angels of the presence. That's right. Yeah, We read about that in the Testament of Levi just a minute ago, too. So they hear this. So there's another set called the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden because they literally hear the sound of him physically walking in the garden. Brother, it's just an angel walking up to him for to say, hey, what are you guys doing? Where you, I mean, they're carrying the message of the father because that the father is at the most high at the top level of ferment. Right, but the 10, sound 14. of them, the sound of them walking in the garden is not the message. Well, all I'm trying to like, say, they, they hid because carrying. they heard. Yeah, the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. That's that means yeah. in, in the whole concept of the angels, they represent the Father. They're sent to represent just like Yeshua now has been glorified, given all authority in heaven and earth. He's greater than the angels. And Hebrews 1 1 through 3 tells us he's the exact representation of the Father. He represents the Father now. Mm -hmm. And if you so, guys agree yeah. that Yahweh and Yeshua are not the same literal biological entity, then when it says right here, yeah. it says that Yahweh God. Yeah, I mean, I don't think either of them are biological. Yeshua was for a minute, and he got a new okay. spiritual body. Take that word out, because you you said already that you agree they're right. the same entity. Yeah, yeah, but they're one. It's like if me and you shared a consciousness. We have two bodies, but we're 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 one in mo in motive. I, we only do what the other one wants to us to do. If like it's it's a quantum relationship. It's outside of our thing. We're so we're, so we're can, dumb human kids. Like we're we're retarded. <laughs> yeah. Compared to the compared to the heavenly like things. Yeah. Uh, so all I would say, guys, is it seems like this theory is from our perspective, is that you're taking Yahweh the Old Testament and you're having to make him Yeshua, which the text doesn't say that. In fact, there's multiple it other it does not well, say that. Absolutely does not. In Psalm 2, 7 why 12, Proverbs chapter 30, it. verse 4. It, it really does, guys. And this is where, you know, they're going to have to study it for themselves. We've, I think we both provided, you know, decent amounts of information on both sides. But at least from where, and West Blaze, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, okay? But at least from where our understanding is, is that you guys' theory on this bride teaching has to make Yeshua Yahweh the Old Testament in order for, the bride to, to be the people. Whereas we've tried to show from scripture, even in the old Testament, Yahweh calls his son God, which means a ruler. And then that God marries new Zion, the new Jerusalem, as well as the sons of the woman, the new Jerusalem marries her in covenant, marries her, goes into covenant with her. And this is how we live in her. This is why she's called our inheritance in Isaiah 54, 17. And so therefore right. the father is still there, but his son is the one that brings us into covenant with the land because that's what we're promised is the land. We're not this promised. Is, this is where I, I'll interject this. Everything I agree with your, uh, like almost all of everything of you guys saying of your, with your theory, but we take and we add the people are now part of the city. I just, I, yeah, respectfully, I tried to show the distinction that, uh, between the city actually going into covenant with the people separately from even Yeshua. That's what Isaiah 62, 4 and 5 directly tells us. Unless it's referring to the people as well. 
No, it, okay. All right, well, yeah, we'll just have to agree. I mean, what, how does the city have righteousness? Because she's made perfect. She's did she, and this is where I didn't have time to go into Isaiah 54, where it talks about how she was made desolate, but then she's restored and renewed. She's made good again, because this is where Yeshua goes to prepare this place for us, the city of righteousness. Yes, the saints will have robes of righteousness and we'll be living inside her. Yes, I agree with you. That's clear. That's our inheritance. Mm -hmm. Yes, but the city itself will be able to have unique properties as explained in Isaiah and Revelation. And as that she is be able to create food from herself, she's be able to facilitate the throne of God. She's also uh, considered to emanate light from herself and she's able to defend herself, which is what we literally see happening in Revelation 27 through 10. Yep. So there's a character in scripture that people don't talk about and don't research because of the theory that you guys hold. It ignores this character because it has to conflate these different ideas. And so people don't know who the kingdom of God is. That's called Zion in the Old Testament, New Jerusalem in the New Testament. And guys, this is the message of Yeshua. He literally said, I came to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God, for this is why I was sent in Luke chapter 4, 43 and 44. And the kingdom is within you. He also said that. No, he didn't. That's Luke 17, 21. And if you look in the Greek, it's literally saying that I... <laughs> You have to go to it, brother. But he says right. the kingdom is at hand and it's in your midst. And that was talking about him standing in their midst at that moment, doing the behavior yeah. of the kingdom. Yeah. I just wanted to throw my, you know, one last thought. Uh, I'm going to have to head out here, guys. Uh, I got to pass off the Internet to my wife. But um, uh, okay. just Sorry, the, Jake. thanks for staying on, brother. Yeah. Yeah. Just the premise of, you know, the the God of the Old Testament, right? Yahweh of the Old Testament being have having always been the mediator is what I was trying to bring out with those passages in the Targum and, and what Tony was kind of hinting at where he was talking about uh, to the disciples expounding of himself and all of the you know, Moses and the prophets, he was expounding of himself and this, this language, the word throughout scripture. Um, if, if we, if we take the context of John and we understand that Yahushua is the word and if the Targums is anything to put weight in, then the language throughout the Targums, whenever Yah, the Most High, the Father, is interacting with mankind. It is always through His Word. And that's where we get this whole premise that the covenant, the marriage at Sinai would have been through the Word, the Messiah, Yahushua, and the people. And so that's why it's not, you know, you know, breaking Torah for us to be remarried back into covenant with Yahushua, who provided some, himself, you know, an eligible bachelor, you know, with the whole, you know, uh, you know, Deuteronomy, you know, context of the marriage of uh, divorce and remarriage, the law there that's talked about also in um, the New Testament and in Jeremiah 3. That's why it's not breaking of Torah for us to remarry back into covenant to the mediator, because um, if he was the word throughout the scripture that, that Yah was making covenant through, then that's why there is this premise of, of a Christophany type you know thing happening where Yah of the Old Testament has always been the mediator and it is the most high, the father that is, has been mediating to man through the word throughout the scripture. And that's why this marriage language can apply to the people in a New Testament concept. And, and uh, I, hear so you, anyways, I, I think in conclusion, I think the biggest reason why we would disagree with your stance is because Yeshua was not promised to be that place of mediation until after he's came, died and resurrected and ascended to the father again. That's literally what's prophesied of him. So you were imposing his priesthood upon him before it's prophesied in the word of him. So therefore, well, he was the lamb, we should, lamb slain we before the foundations, right? So if yeah, but that his doesn't happen until works for those in the old testament. So people are the saved, just right. as in the There's, old testament is, they have to be saved by the Messiah, just as in the. Yeah, the yeah, New we, testament. we already explained. Yeah, so we we did explain yeah. that. Well, we tried to at least to say that all mankind are saved by Jesus. So that there's an idea of propitiation that is accomplished by the angels in heaven through their priesthood, but still all men go to Sheol to await resurrection, which is only accomplished by Yeshua in Revelation 3, 5. So we, we acknowledge that Yeshua's priesthood and his atonement made for us, it goes both ways before and after the cross. But the point is, Yeshua wasn't destined, and the Father's own words talks about Yeshua's priesthood only coming after he comes in the womb of a woman, dies and resurrects again. So this is where it's, just, it's like you guys but have you're to saying two things, it. though. Yeah, it no. doesn't go backwards. So no, I, his mediation no, I, doesn't go backwards. You're I saying. just said it did. I, I just said it did. When I said all mankind go to then we agree. And resurrection. Then we agree. But what you're talking about is you're trying to say that in the garden, 
that was the word that in, and I, we tried to show you, you know, the passages that were is actually angels, but you're saying that it was Yeshua himself who was mediating on behalf of Adam and Eve in the garden. And I'm saying that's a literal term. You're using terminology of a priesthood, which is a literal job function. And you're you're kind of taking it so loosely that you're forgetting that that literal job was promised at a specific time in prophecy. And it was not promised to, to Yeshua in Genesis. It wasn't promised until he came, died, and was resurrected. So okay. therefore, you you would be taking his priesthood out of context and placing it in a timeline that doesn't apply to him according to the Father's word. Because you, the Father, you still agree it retroactively works. So this is where, guys, it, you know, yeah. I think uh, what we're talking, I think the big misunderstanding here is you guys and, and what how you may understand or feel about what re is required at the first resurrection and where the souls of men go when they die to await resurrection, because this is what Yeshua takes care of once he attains, attains his priesthood. So this is why, even though I read you that passage from Testimony of Levi, chapter three, up until Yeshua returns on the day of the Lord and the last trumpet sounds, all men die and go to wait Sheol to wait resurrection. This is something I was going to ask you earlier, Tony, based on something you said about that passage in Second Ezra. Do you believe that there are any human beings other than Yeshua in heaven right now? Above the firmament? I don't think so. Okay, good. I mean, uh, yeah. no, because no man can stand in front of the Father. Well, just that, you know, a lot of people believe that since Yeshua came and, and resurrected, that he took back people with him or that, you know, he. Yeah, they don't know. they don't research. The first a trick question. I thought it was a trick question. So I got no, 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 no. We just don't simple, know. We just don't know. A simple question. I was like, oh, is this a trick hey, question? Jake, Jake, if you got to go, brother, I understand. And Tony, if you'd like, we have some questions in the audience. If you if you want to stay for yeah. questions. Otherwise, I mean, you're welcome to, brother, cool. even though I think Jake has to leave. But um I appreciate right, well, Jake. Care, you, guys. Jake, Jake, you stay with us for like two hours, brother. We love it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we take love care, you. Bye. Take care. Have a good night. So, guys, if you have questions, put them in the chat. Put them in all caps. Um, I think I saw some up, uh, some earlier. Excuse me. I saw some questions further up earlier on. Um, but there's the chat's been going wild, guys. There's a lot of people in the chat that are on both sides of this issue, it's and so wild. Yeah, I man. Know, I just want to know who has to freestyle tonight. Who has to bring the bars? <laughs> that's you, man. That's you. No. <laughs> you guys could do something right. together. Yeah, right. I, I um, we don't have to do. Wes, I, Wes, I was going to tell you, I was, I'm doing a song with uh, Dirt. Yeah. Where I, uh, I wrote, I was having a panic attack, and so I wrote the verse like crying out like to Abba for the verse, and he's writing it as God's response back. It's going to be okay. Wow. So looks like our, our first like question is, um, I guess someone is congrating you or L. Wilkins 25. Congrats you on the new baby, Tony. Sweet. Thank you. But well, it's not here yet, but yeah. any day. it's any day, maybe even as we're talking. Right. Also, the, I think the question is, can you supply one verse where Yeshua calls us his bride or says he came to remarry Israel? Uh, I mean, it's, it's all metaphorical, the same as, it, it is for the new Jerusalem. It's basically references it as a bride. It's always referenced as a bride. I think Both ways. Specifically, or she's specifically asking where Yeshua calls us. Yeah. Yeshua himself calls us his bride or says he came to remarry Israel. Oh no. Okay. Looks like we have uh, someone that just doesn't like my opinion. Sean's wrong. It's all over the paleo Hebrew, even though I had just explained earlier, I broke down the paleo Hebrew. That's <laughs> And she's asking, what are your thoughts on Judges 6, 19 through 24? Give me a minute and I'll pull it up for us so you can easily read it. Here it goes. All right. You said 19 to 24? Yeah, it's it's on screen. Oh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. yes. So Gideon went in and prepared a young goat and a leavened bread from an ephah flower. He put the meat in the basket and the broth in the pot and brought them out to him under the oak and presented them. The angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. And the angel of the Lord put out the end of his staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread. And the fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. Then the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. And when Gideon saw that he was the angel of the Lord, he said, oh, alas, the Lord God, for now I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. The Lord said to him, peace to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and named it that the Lord is peace. To this day, it is still an Ophrah of the Abiezrites. 
What do you think about that, bud? Thoughts? I mean, what? I'm why? What is this? Like, <laughs> it's. I, I've already said there's like I, there, there's angels. So uh, maybe, I, unfortunately, dude, Jeremiah fifteen sixteen didn't elaborate on her question, but I'm guessing because of the content she's asking you, Tony, do you think that this was a pre-incarnate Yeshua? I there's no way to tell. Okay. No way to know whether it was. Or not. All right, fair enough. Do we think that any time where an angel is used that it could be referring to Yeshua ever? It's, could be. I know that. I mean, it's angel means messenger. And what more of a messenger is the word? So, I mean, Yeshua could be a messenger or some another angel could be the messenger. So what and, if the word, what if the term the word was synonymous mm -hmm. with the term a message from the Lord? When it says the word, the word of the Lord showed up and said this or this to Isaiah. What if it was mm -hmm. just a message from the Lord showed up and said this is literally the angels. The word angel means messenger. Right. Right. I do know that. We were both just saying that. So I'm just saying we have other texts that directly tell us these are angels in these occasions, especially on Mount Sinai, especially. Um, that is the entire narration of that book of Jubilees is that it's Moses talking with an angel and that angel is telling him how he showed up to Abraham multiple times throughout his life. All the places so we see. Yeshua is an angel. No, it says he's no. made higher than the angels. And he yeah. I mean, but he's a messenger. No, no. I mean, you're, you would be taking the word messenger and like, OK, so you've got different classes of angels. Would we agree with that? Yeah. 100%. Right. OK, so the Ophanim, Seraphim. Cherubim, different things like that. We got the Watchers. Yep. Um, Yeshua was made higher than all them anyway. This is this is you know for uh, Colossians chapter one fifteen through eighteen. This is Revelation three fourteen. This is John seventeen three through five. Yeah. You know, so before time again, this is Enoch chapter forty six and chapter forty eight. Before time began, Yeshua was already there with the Father. Right. Um, I personally believe that Genesis one twenty six, the us is the yep. Father and the Son talking. Let us make man in our image. That's why when Daniel and Enoch sees images of the Father and the Son, it looks like a man. I agree with that. Right? So that's my that's my understanding. Um, I do believe that they're the elders or an angelic council that was since they were created on day one, they were already there, like Job Job thirty seven talks about and, and Julius two talk about. So I do believe that they were there in this process, but Yeshua himself was created from the Father before the world was ever created. Whereas Trinitarians would say, oh, well, he was never created. He was just always with the Father in existence. Uh, and this, is, this is where you run into a lot of who will agree with you. Yeah. But, then, but I, I say it this way. You can divide infinite into an infinite amount of infinites. If you break off half of infinite, they're both still infinite. So when he divided himself and made his son. If, if Yeshua embodied uh, infinite from all of time eternity behind us then ah, where was i going with that then why does he say that his father is is greater than him because he put himself underneath him he submitted well that that's what happens that was about submission. Was about submit sacrifice and submission that's the whole bible well before he sacrificed do you say in the father that the issue was was as great as the father no as soon like when he was made he was made to put himself underneath as soon as you like to put your submission is a uh, sacrifice. It well, is just, just your own will. Isn't it just by, by the very terminology and logic of someone calling oneself a father and someone else being called the son was that the son would be under submission to the father. It, right. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. And that they came sequentially um, chronologically and you know, that Yeshua is after meaning that he was created, meaning at one point he did not exist. And then this day I begot you, like the father says, then he existed because he was brought forth and begotten from the father. Right. Right. From the father. So he it, within within the father. This is why it what? says the word. <laughs> so did the everything word. then. Then that means you did too, brother. And <laughs> he said, that, that, I died, you know? yeah, no, you yeah. have to gods. Yeshua said that. Yeah. But you get to that point of Elohim status when you get your resurrected yeah. body. That's right. why Yeshua tells us Luke 20, 36 would mean like the angels at the resurrection. You're not there yet. No, I don't know. We're talking about, we were just talking about before time again, before Genesis one, the father and the son at some point 
the son had to come forth from the father. That's why they, one is called the father and one's called the son. That's all. I think you agree with that. That's where I get that they are one. That's like, I, I mean, I use the word one the same way Yeshua uses the word one. Right. Then you mean they're they're one in purpose and unity, but they're not the right. same biological entity. Okay, absolutely. It's so not. we got Miss Diana Ebers is in the chat tonight. Welcome, Miss Diana. She's asking all three of you. This is to all three of us. Have we have we ever thought of the concept of the bridegroom and the bride with regards to the first Adam and the first Eve, and Yeshua being the second Adam came to redeem a second Eve, which would be Israel? I haven't. I never thought of that. No, I, uh, Miss Diane, I haven't, I haven't thought of that either. And I don't know if you just joined the broadcast or if you had, I mean, we're at like two hours and 30 minutes. So I don't know if you had a chance to see all the verses we laid out in the first two hours, but, um, there would be a lot of reasons in the scriptures why we would not take that interpretive view. Um, I think Tony takes it more of a view of, of the, the father is considers Israel as a bride. Um, but he also thinks that that is the son is included in that process, which is how he includes Israel to be a part of the bride through Yeshua in his view. Whereas West Blaze and West Blaze and I, we we view more of what we feel the scriptures say in a more literal, direct fashion that uh, the son is very much differentiated from the father, and that the bride of the lamb, the bride of the son, is specifically told to us as the city, the land of inheritance. And we, as resurrected saints, will also go into covenant with the land of inheritance at our resurrection underneath the authority of Yeshua at the same time after the first resurrection um, when the kingdom of heaven, you know, comes to earth basically. So um, I don't think either, I don't think any three of us take that type of interpretive view of this. So, but thank you for your question. I like other views though. Yeah. Yeah. It's something to think about. We see second Adam being mentioned, right? Like (laughs) that terminology, we just don't ever see a second Eve being referred to. (laughs) Guys, thanks for joining me. Uh, we've come to the end of the broadcast. We went actually extra right. long tonight, but I really want to figure it was going to. Yeah, yeah man. I would give a big shout out to Jake Grant and Tony Stover for joining me. West Blaze Jones is thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Go check yep. out uh, Anthony Stover. Go check him out on Take on the World TV on YouTube. Make sure you check out Jake Grant's channel on YouTube as well as West Blaze Music on YouTube. So that way you guys can get more of what they do. They do some great stuff. I have great conversations, help you in the word. So um, guys, any last words before we go? Shalom, everybody. Uh, we appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. May Yah bless you and keep you. And I'm glad that uh, that we're allowed to do this. Right. Yeah, me too. Hey, the cool thing is, w- w- no matter what's, what, who's right, we're going to find out. Yeah, yeah. That's right. And, that's right. And both ways are super beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. So it's not, so it's kind of like we're arguing over am I going to get a million dollars or a million dollars? Like it's like well, it's both awesome. So it's one day we'll see it. Real talk. Yeah, yeah, brother. I think the biggest the biggest concern I've seen from uh, the interpretation that you guys were talking about, which we learned through this conversation, you actually don't hold the same interpretation as a lot of other people. Um, you kind of veer off into a little bit different way, but um, I've seen lots of bad bad theology uh, about why Yeshua went to the cross because of this divorce and remarriage conversation. And so they actually take his priesthood completely out of it and they just say, well, he came to the cross. So therefore Israel can be in covenant again. And it just, it makes for really, really wonky and messy, messy theology. So um, thanks for coming on and clarifying your position. And uh, I think it was an edifying conversation. I do. Yeah. So appreciate you guys. All right. Thank you everyone in the chat. We'll see you guys next time.